This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most celebrated cases. These are accurate records drawn from these files by special permission of Sir Harold Scott, Commissioner of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which for obvious reasons have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, Chief Crime Reporter for the London Daily Express. And the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Scotland Yard, the London headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, is situate near the embankment on Whitehall, hard by 10 Downing Street and almost in the shadow of Big Ben. Here also is the headquarters of the CID, the Criminal Investigation Department, the body of men whose exploits for more than a hundred years have made the name Scotland Yard synonymous with the brilliant detection of crime and unrelenting pursuit of the criminal, and the presentation of the painstakingly acquired evidence that assures his eventual punishment. On the lower ground floor of New Scotland Yard is the famous Black Museum, where whose present custodian is Chief Superintendent James Davidson, a Scotland Yard veteran. Behind this door... Good afternoon. This Black Museum of ours is rather unique. Everything in it was at one time connected with the successful solution of a crime. All was closely involved in the crime itself. We possess an imposing collection of lethal weapons here, each carefully docketed to indicate its origin. Here are half-empty bottles of almost every poison known to man, together with a statement of particulars concerning its use. Here are the blood-stained garments on which the solution of a crime of violence depended. Among the Black Museum's relics are disguises used by famous criminals, death masks of notorious men and women whose ends Scotland Yard encompassed, and a great many other more gruesome mementos of man's inhumanity to man. Among the exhibits are others seemingly incongruous objects that in their time served well in the undoing of desperate criminals. Such an exhibit is this one the fragments of a set of teacups. This collection of shards was the first step in the solution of a frightful crime which occurred during the Blitz of July 1940. Yes, sir? Will you please bring me file number 302MR651, Constable? Uh, 302MR651, sir? Yes, sir. One, sir. In July 1940, the Battle of Britain was at its height. The Luftwaffe hits us at all hours, and from advanced defense fields of the RAF, the weary spitfires rose day and night to do battle. Thousands of British people died in Britain as a result of enemy action. But in the midst of the very present war, murder went on as usual. Chief Superintendent Peter Carruth received a telephone call at Scotland Yard on the morning of the 3rd of July, a Wednesday. Mark 302MR651, sir. Thank you. The call was from Chief Constable at Matfield, the Kentage village near Tunbridge. The Chief Constable reported the finding of the bodies of three women shot to death and requested the assistance of the CID. The services of Scotland Yard are available to the provincial police at all times if requested. The Home Office assuming all expenses if the request is made within 24 hours of the discovery of the crime. At their own expense, if we're called in after that. Chief Superintendent Carruth was gratified that the request came at the very beginning of the case, and he drove to Matfield at once with a medical examiner from the Home Office and Detective Sergeant Small, also Scotland Yard, they were met at the scene of the crime by Matfield Chief Constable Thomas Bennett. It's good of you to come so quickly, all of you. It's all quite beyond us here, sir. What with the blitz and all? I'm sure. I had a bad time. Having it, sir. Yes, I have no doubt. No doubt, Mr. Bennett. Spitfires. Jerry must be up again. Well, 
Here's what happened. In the house, there's Miss Evans, the servant. Uh, is she dead? Two holes in her head. Uh, Play, place all ransacked. All tore up. Where are the others? Mrs. Ames and her daughter Jessica's lying down there in the orchard. Also shot. Yes, I, I see. Where do you want to start, sir? Um, a house, I think, first. Uh, come in, then, sir. Uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. They've lived here in Matfield a long time. Have they done it? Miss Evans, the servant, has always lived here. Mrs. Ames and her daughter moved here a year ago. Mrs. Ames a widow? No. Estranged from her husband, though they're quite friendly. He lives at Piddington. Oh, yes, I know. I've been there. Owns a farm. Does he know about this? My station sergeant telephoned him this morning, sir. He was in London, but he'll be home this evening. Shall I uh, go first, sir? She's... Lying right by the door, and you might trip over her. By all means. You might arrive there. Uh, these is the gentleman from Scotland Yard, Constable. Yes, sir. Uh, this is her. Miss Margaret Evans, sir. Age 61. Seven. Living in. Ah. Oh. See what you can find out, Bernard. Right, Your Honor. Small, get started looking for fingerprints. Yes, sir. Place has really been ransacked, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. What's missing? Haven't checked yet, sir. Haven't touched anything. Good. Well, not much chance of finding out if anything is gone, though. Everybody that lived here is dead. I'd like to see the others. Right, sir. If you'll come with me. Oh, uh, what's that over there? Mm-hmm. Tea things? Yes, sir. Looks as if she dropped the tray when she saw the murderer. Have a look at them, too, Small. All right, sir. Uh, down this part, sir. The orchard, uh, that's where they are. Mrs. Ames? And her daughter, Jessica. Mm. They have many visitors? Very few, sir. And the place is back from the road, isn't a bit by the roses. Hard to tell they do, have. Here she is. This is the daughter, I suppose. Right, sir. Her mother's over there, off the path. Daughter was running away toward the house. Mother was facing the other way. Shot in the back, too. Aye. Found anything here in the grass? Cartridge cases, something? Well, no, sir. Uh, oh, we, we did find this glove, though, sir. Uh, sorry, I had it in my pocket. Almost forgot it. <sighs> Woman's glove. Size six, I'd say. Hogskin. Shop sells thousands a week. Left hand. Whose is it? Isn't Mrs. Ames, sir, too small? Or Miss Jessica's either. Uh, too large, I'd say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, maybe the murderer, sir. We'll see. All you found? All so far, sir. Mm. Where was the glove? Oh, over there, sir. I, I marked the spot with those uh, two sticks. Uh huh. Alongside the mother's body. Yes, sir. Well, as soon as Bernard's examined the bodies, I think you'd better have all this grass scythed down and see if you can find anything else. Cartridge case or anything. Uh, right, sir. Shall we walk back to the house? Yes, sir. Glancing, lad. Take a Walk in the fighter chap up there. Oh, oh, oh. Hope he shoots some of Jerry's bloody ears off. He probably will. Got a son in the raft. Flight sergeant of the Coastal Command. Good man. Nineteen years old. When I was nineteen, I was a farm man for good old Uncle Tom Cobbler. Hey, I wonder if they found anything yet in there, sir. We'll see. Ah, oh, here's Bernard. Anything yet? Well, I, uh, I want to see the other bodies first. Discovered a little so far. Uh, where are the, um... Uh... Down the path back there, sir. We've touched nothing. Except this glove. Oh, is this one of theirs? Wrong size. All right. Uh, you can remove the bodies as soon as I finish, Chief Constable. Yes, sir. I'll have the van here at once. Uh, see to it, please. Yes, sir. What are you doing, Small? I'm trying to fit these cups together, sir. Well, what about fingerprints? I wanted you oh, to... I found a good many, sir. They all checked with hers. Oh, how did you know they were hers? Oh, I took hers. I wish live people's were as easy to take. No others? Well, I'm not sure yet, sir. As soon as I get the others down there, I'll make a very thorough check. These cups and saucers. She dropped them when she saw the murderer, probably. Oh, quite. But why should there be four cups, sir? Four? One for the mother... One for the daughter. 
One for the maid? For her? His Evans was more a companion than a servant, sir. Here in Matfield, we... Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes. And one for the murderer. I then must have known the murderer. People don't usually offer a cup of tea to a perfect stranger. You could make up a list of their friends, Chief Constable, uh, and then... Very few friends, sir. Kind of standoffish like they was, and... But the parson, the grocer, postmistress, not in a real close friend, so to speak. Make up a list and check where they all were yesterday. Yes, sir. What about this estranged husband of Mrs. Ames? Would he have a motive? Oh, I don't think so, sir. He used to come visit her, I know, but... Oh, he did, eh? And he's in London now, you said? I went down yesterday morning, they said, sir. Where does he live, do you say? Piddington, sir, near Oxford. Uh, you take over, Sergeant Small, you and Mr. Bernard. I'll call you from Piddington. Piddington, sir? Uh, do you think... I that... think I'd like to know whether our friendly ex-husband was really in London yesterday or elsewhere. <laughs> Piddington, that afternoon, 70 miles away from that field, Jem Davies, the man of all work, explained to Chief Superintendent Carruth that John Ames had not yet returned from London. Miss Viola Masterson, the manager of the Ames farm, however, was at home, recovering from an accident. Carruth spoke to her in her sitting room. Her left arm was in bandages, and she was obviously in slight pain. Carruth sympathized with her. I'm so sorry to disturb you, Miss Masterson. It's quite all right. I'll be up and about in a day or so. It pains a little, though, now. I suppose you've heard about the former Mrs. Ames and her daughter. I'm so dreadfully sorry. I knew them slightly, you know. Oh, did you? I'd have gone over to Matfield if I hadn't been so stupid as to fall off my bicycle and injure my arm. I'm afraid I'm not a very good cyclist. Oh, do you have any clues as to the... the... Murderer? And very few at the moment. Very few, I'm afraid. Oh, what a pity. Mr. Ames went to London yesterday. Hmm? Yes. He was probably in London while his former wife and daughter were murdered. He often stopped in to see them on his way. If he'd stopped there yesterday, he might have prevented it. Yes, yes. I suppose he can account for his movements yesterday. I'm quite sure he can, Superintendent. I expect him at any moment. You were here at the farm all day. I rode about the farm all day in my bicycle until I had the accident. Ah. I'm sure Jemmy Davis can confirm that. And the bicycle is still where I left it, where I fell off, unless Jemmy's brought it back. I see. Uh, by the way, have you ever seen this glove before? Oh, let me see it. No, I'm afraid not. Did it belong to... We're not quite sure. Well, it's not mine. That's too big for me, I'm sure, Superintendent. You've never seen it before? Never. Thank you, Miss Masterson. Is that all you wanted? Aren't you going to wait for Mr. Ames? Oh, I don't like to disturb you, Miss Masterson. I'll wait out there with Jemmy. It is Jemmy, isn't it? Uh, by all means, talk to Jemmy. I'm sure he'll confirm everything I've said. Good day, Miss Masterson. You know where to find Jemmy? <laughs> he was sitting alongside the stable door cleaning a shotgun and I last saw him. Jemmy Davis was a simple-minded man. He didn't realize that he was talking much too freely to the friendly Scotland Yard man. Well, it'd, it'd be a terrible thing, I expect, but I don't shed no tears for him. I didn't like her nor her daughter neither. Hated them? It'd be none of my business, sir. But now, Mr. Ames, uh, he'd be a real fine man. And she... He, well, uh, she treated him awful bad. How? Dug in the manger. Kicks him out, she does. And then when he finally meets a woman he loves, and that woman loving him, she won't give him no divorce. You seem to know a lot about Mr. Ames' affairs, Jemmy. Yeah. Him and me, we be just like that. I do anything for that man. Her too, for that matter. Who? Miss Marchison. There. Well, it's pretty clean, ain't it? Let's see. Seems hmm. I'd ever want a gun to be. <laughs> Had it for years. Old fashioned, like me. <laughs> ah, but she'd be a good shotgun. He uses it all the time for rabbits. Mr. Ames? Well, buys his own shells, too. Hmm. Uh, Miss Masterson, she's scared of it. 
tried to teach her how to shoot it. But she was scared. <laughs> hey, you couldn't kill a person with this here gun, I says to her. Not unless you got up real close. Funny thing, though. She shot a rabbit with it yesterday. <laughs> you know, it made her so sick at her stomach when she shot the poor little fella. Never again, she says to me. <laughs> Did you see the rabbit, Jemmy? <laughs> well, what were left of it, she were too close. Well, not worth bringing back to cook. <laughs> you know, I think that's why she fell off her bicycle thinking about it. Where did she fall? Well, she was in the meadow yonder. We all slipped on the grass. Jenny, did you ever see this glove before? Huh? No, sir. Oh, can't say as how I have. Sure? No, sir. Whose is it? I found it. Well, finders keepers. Uh, that's what they say. So you don't think Mr. Ames and Miss Masterson will be upset by Mrs. Ames' death? No, bless you, no, sir. Now they can get married. Well, that dog in the manger wife of his. Oh, he must have been the last one to see her alive. Oh? How's that? When he stopped to see her on the way to London yesterday. Why, I thought you was going to wait for him to come back, sir. Chief Superintendent Carew hurried to the local police station where he put through a trunk telephone call to Matfield. Detective Sergeant Small, the Scotland Yard man, answered the telephone at the murder house. Small here. Small, I want you to check at once on something. Yes, sir. I want you to make the most diligent inquiries. Get that chief constable there to inquire of every person in Matfield, if necessary, at once to discover if this man Ames was seen in Matfield yesterday. You got that? He was seen, sir. He was? The postman, sir. We've been making inquiries all over the village of Mrs. Ames' known friends, and we've come across several curious things, sir. Well? Oh, the, the postman observed Mr. Ames walking toward this house yesterday afternoon. He sure? We positively identified him, sir. Known him for years. Spoke to him, called him by name, and Ames replied. What else? He was carrying a shotgun, sir. Oh. I discovered here that he intended to visit them. But the gun... Well, looks as if he's our man, doesn't it? What else did you discover? Well, there's a bicycle belonging to Mrs. Ames is missing. Oh? And the porter at the railway station reports a strange woman carrying a parcel arrived in town yesterday, but so far we have been unable to trace her. Now, the local police have picked up a deserter from an army camp near here. He's being questioned now. Oh. And a lorry driver for the gas company at Oxford reports picking up a woman on the highway near here yesterday afternoon. She was wearing one glove. Oh? Now, he thinks her bare hand was scratched and bleeding. Yes? She explained she'd fallen off her bicycle and was trying to catch a train. He took it to the railway station. And then... Oh, what did you say, sir? I didn't say anything. Oh, I was speaking to Dr. Bernard, sir. I'll put him on. He wants to speak to you. Uh, thank you. You there, Carruth? Yes, Bernard. I've discovered why you didn't find any spent cartridges, Superintendent. Yes? The women were killed with a shotgun, probably a 410 shotgun. Yes, yes, I know. The uh, murderer had to pick the discharged shell out of the breech of the gun by hand. Yes, but... It... It probably carried them away and disposed of them elsewhere. Did you recover any of the shot from the bodies? Yes, quite small pellets. Uh, bird shot. Mark it in evidence and hold it for me. I think those little lead pellets are going to hang someone, Bernard. <laughs> Back at the Piddington farm, Chief Inspector Carew found that Ames had returned in his absence. Jamie, the garrulous man of all work, was just leaving. He was going to fetch Miss Masterson's abandoned bicycle, he I said. Why be going out to fetch Miss Masterson's bicycle, sir? Look here, Jamie. Would you like a half a crown? What for? That rabbit Miss Masterson shot. Is it near where she left the bicycle? Oh, fur long or two, sir. Fetch it back, boy. What for, sir? Well, he's been fit to eat. She were too close. Oh. I've a fancy to see how that gun of yours works, Jim. Oh, that old gun of mine? Uh, she be a very good gun, sir. Show me. Here. Well. Good man. Now, is Mr. Ames in the house? Aye, right, sir. Now, I'll, I'll fetch the rabbit and show you. But the poor thing will be all full of bird shot, sir. That'll be all right, Jimmy. I'm very interested in bird shot. Sh 
here. I'm Chief Superintendent Carruth of Scotland Yard. You're John Ames, hmm? Yes. Now, you're the gentleman who was here this afternoon. Yes. May I come in? Do. You've come about the murder of my wife and daughter. Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Carruth, you said? Yes. I cannot pretend any great grief, although I am shocked at the tragic. May I sit down? I, um, I spoke to Miss Masterson, your manager, this afternoon. She said you were here. Perhaps if Miss Masterson is strong enough... Here I am. Oh, sit down, my dear. Please, sit down. Don't hurt my hand, John. I'm all right. Well, sir? Am I correct in assuming that, uh, with the death of Mr. Ames and strange wife, you and he... Uh... We can be married, yes. Mr. Ames? That is true. My wife has consistently refused to give me a divorce. Although we were on fairly good terms... She and I weren't. I'm glad she's dead. Violet, And yes. that horrid daughter of hers, too. Now we're rid of them once and for all. Violet. Do you share Miss Masterson's views, Miss Ames? I... I'm afraid... And perhaps he's not as ferocious as I am, but he shares my views all right. Don't you, John? Uh... Yes. And what were you doing with a shotgun on the way to our home yesterday, Mr. Ames? John, you didn't... You didn't... Mr. Ames! You, you didn't tell me. Oh, John! John, now you spoiled everything. Your wife and your daughter were murdered with a shotgun, Mr. Ames. I didn't do he it. He didn't, he didn't, I say. What gauge is your shotgun, Mr. Ames? This is absurd, Mr. Yes, of course it's Why absurd. do you... Why do you think it's absurd? My dear sir, my gun, which incidentally is an American-made Remington over and under 12 gauge, has been broken for four weeks. You see? Broken? The sear spring is broken. It's quite impossible to fire the gun. You can examine the gun at your leisure at Henny McGovern's The Gunsmiths on High Holborn in London, where I took it yesterday. We'll check that. Why did you visit your wife yesterday, carrying your broken gun? I dropped off in Matfield on my way to London to have the gun repaired. I begged her again to give me a divorce. She refused? She refused again. <laughs> for the last time. And we're going to be married now at last. Don't expect us to weep for her. Whoever killed her should be given a medal. Viola. Oh, stop it. You're just as glad as I am. Aren't you? Excuse me. The telephone. Yes? Yes, he's here. One moment. It's for you, Mr. Carruth. Thank you. Chief Superintendent Carruth, him. Small here, sir. We found Mrs. Ames' missing bicycle. Oh. Yes, sir. It was discovered in a ditch close to the place where the lorry driver picked up the woman with one glove. A bird. And there are numerous fingerprints on the handlebar, sir, but of the right hand only. Most interesting. And the strange woman whom the railway reporter observed was uh, carrying a parcel, you remember? Yes, yes, of course. Well, it was a, a long parcel about the length of a gun, he says, wrapped in brown paper. I see. Have you taken the things you spoke about? Things, sir? Yes. Oh, oh, the, the fingerprints on the bicycle? Yes, quite. Yes, sir, I've taken them. How soon could I see them and the people you spoke of? Up there, sir? Yes. Well, there's enough train that we can have stop at Pittington leaving here in half an hour, sir. I think you'd better come, then, if you can find the others you mentioned. I'll meet you at the Pittington station. Right, sir. Goodbye. I'm very sorry. Could I ask? You have uncovered some other evidence, sir? You're not going to arrest John, then? He won't be charged with murder? I think I can almost assure you that you will not be charged with murder, Mr. Ames. I'm sorry, I, I, I must go and meet my colleagues. This is quite important. Will you be coming back? I probably shall. I, I shall want to be able to assure Mr. Ames that he will not be held. Oh, John. <laughs> <laughs> Is the Scotland Yard man still here, Mr. Ames? Why, uh, I'm here, Jenny. Well, I, I bet she's a dead rabbit, sir. With your half crown's worth of birdshot. They met him at 
at the railway station two hours later. Detective Sergeant Small, Chief Constable Bennett, the lorry driver who had picked up the woman with the bloody hand and the one glove, and the railway porter who had observed the woman carrying the brown paper parcel the size of a gun. Leaving Chief Constable Bennett at the station to make a telephone call, the party proceeded to the Ames Farm. Oh. Good evening, Mr. Carew. May we come in, please? Why, this is quite a delegation. May we come in, please? I suppose... <clears throat> Do come in, although... Thank you. Where's Miss Masterson? Viola? Yes, dear. Why, what... Uh, Miss Masterson, do you recognize any of these people? Why? Why, no, of course not. Patterson, do you recognize this woman? Eh? Hey, she's the lady in blue slacks I picked up my lorry on the road in Matfield yesterday. The lady that said she fell off her bike. Her hand was all bloody and she had one glove on. Like... This one? Yes, sir. Exactly like that. O'Connor. Yes, sir. Have you ever seen this lady before? I've seen her yesterday, sir. Getting off the 1206 train that passes through Piddington before it gets to Batfield. She was wearing blue slacks and carried a brown paper parcel about the size of a gun, sir. Now, look here. What's the meaning of all this? Yes. Come in. Well, Bennett. Just like you thought, sir. I telephoned the doctor who treated Miss Masterson, and he informs me that he treated her left hand for multiple lacerations, removing particles of road gravel and stains of tarvia from the palm. Miss Masterson, there is no gravel or tarvia at the meadow. Thank you. Mr. Ames, I'm extremely mm. sorry for you. John? Now, we won't get married. Viola Masterson, I arrest you on the charge of willful I murder. I wanted to get married, and she stood in our And I must job. warn you that anything I... you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence against you. John, what have I done? The evidence adduced by Chief Superintendent Carruth, the identifications by the lorry driver and the railway porter, the shotgun pellets which proved identical with those Miss Masterson had fired into the unfortunate rabbit, the glove which was identified as hers by the store which had sold it to her, the gravel from the road in her wounded hand, and the motive, which was all too plain, proved sufficient evidence to convict Viola Masterson of the murders of Mrs. Ames and her daughter and of the servant Margaret Evans who provided the first cue, the fourth cup. Miss Masterson had determined to murder the servant to eliminate the only witness to the murder of the others. In a trial marked with frequent air raid alarms caused by an enemy whose depredations could not prevent murder from going on as usual, she was found criminally insane and is now imprisoned in the asylum at Broadmoor. John Ames was tried as an accomplice, but acquitted. He joined the 1st Battalion of the Baps and was reported missing in action in the Italian campaign. Constable, you may turn the file 302 MR651, the Blitz murder case, to the records room. Good afternoon. You've just heard the first case in the series Whitehall 1212, drawn from the official files of Scotland Yard by permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. All names were changed in this story for obvious reasons, but everything else is true. It occurred. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed for radio by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall 1212, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. <laughs>
the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the Scotland Yard files by special permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which for obvious reasons have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 498MR381. Neville Hutchins, shopkeeper. Yes, I saw the man. Rafe Dibble, taxi driver. I drove into Charing Cross. Arthur Cunningham, the estate agent. I never saw the woman before. Mrs. Veronica Fanshaw, housewife. The woman was a most unsatisfactory housekeeper. Mrs. Leonie Fournier, housekeeper. Inspector Harold Lowe of Scotland Yard. One of these persons is a murderer. Which one do you suspect? Incidentally, if you're looking for what the Americans call cops and robbers with the goods and the bad shooting it out, or if you expect lean, pipe-smoking men in fore-and-aft hats saying, follow that cab, you may be disappointed. The job of a policeman, says Commander Rawlings of the Yard, is 95% perspiration, 3% inspiration, and 2% luck. But we have our moments. We have our moments. Now, having concluded a little sermon for today, and if you're still interested, come along with me. This is Scotland Yard's Black Museum. I'd like you to meet Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the caretaker. Yes? It's Inspector Lowe, sir, and a friend. May we come in? Oh, by all means. Come along. Chief Superintendent William Davidson. Well, how do you do? I expect Lowe has told you all about this place, has he not? Well, uh, frankly, no, sir. I it was hoping... Quite... Well, these cases you see around the wards contain articles of all sorts which were important to us in the solution of crimes. On the other room, there are our murder weapons. Now, here are bits of evidence each of which has played its part in the conviction of a criminal. Here's a blood-stained jacket and a plaster cast of a dead man's hand. Well, what did you wish especially to see, Lowe? Case number 498MR381, sir, if you... Oh, the Fournier case. Right, sir. Oh, here in this corner. Come along. That's a trunk, rather large, old-fashioned black trunk with a heavy lid. It served its purpose admirably. Telephone call received by Inspector Harold Lowe at Scotland Yard, 2.55 p.m., Monday, 10th May, 1948. Inspector Lowe speaking. This is Bannerman in charge of the left luggage room at Charing Cross Station, sir. Yes? We've come across something queer here, sir. Something that I'm afraid wants investigating. What seems to be wrong, Bannerman? I think you ought to see it, sir, really. Well, what is it, it's man? It's a left luggage ticket, sir, that was left by one of the station bootlegs. A found. left luggage ticket? Yes, sir. Well, uh, don't you think... The ticket is for a large, heavy black trunk, which was left here several days ago, sir. Oh, well, that does alter matters, doesn't it? I'm afraid so, sir. Well, I'll be right over. Bannerman, is it? <laughs> Uh, you, Bannerman? Yes? Uh, Detective Inspector Lowe, you spoke to me on the telephone. Oh, yes, sir. Will you just step inside, sir? I'll be away for a few minutes, George. Well, I'll be back. Will you come with me, sir? I've the ticket in my desk, sir. Hmm. Here, sir. Oh. Well, what's wrong with it? It was found on the up platform by one of the boot blacks a few minutes after I'd issued it, sir. Well, the owner lost it. It's exactly the way it was found, sir. All crumpled up in a ball. Yeah. Yes, I see what you mean. A man could lose a ticket, sir, but he wouldn't throw it away just a few moments after he got it, sir. Do you remember the man? Oh, I don't remember him at all, sir. I don't remember if it was a man. What? It might have been a woman, sir. We handle so many people here. Well, is the trunk still here? You said it's for a trunk, didn't you? Yes, sir. It's right over in that bay, sir. Well, have a look at it, please. Follow me. There, sir. The black one. You know, the number's check. Ah. Oh. <clears throat> uh, it's it's very heavy, sir. Let me give you an hand. Yeah. Hmm. Lock doesn't look very strong. Well, I'll have it open. Hmm. Full of cloth. Cloth isn't that heavy. There's something else in here. Take the end of this piece. <gasps> the trunk and its contents were removed at once to Scotland Yard for examination. The contents were taken to the pathological laboratory. 
Detective Sergeant Sean Flannery and I examined the trunk itself. It seems to be very old. It's in good condition, though. Uh, they don't make goods like this nowadays. Well, we shall have to have it tested for dabs, of course. Ah, uh, fingerprints. We'll find millions of them, sir. Man of the left, luggage rooms, our own people. The late occupants. Uh, and from the age of it, we're likely to find Oliver Cromwell's. Ah, but talk. What's this? What? I'm afraid our friends should have removed that. What? It's a label. Here, give us the magnifying glass, will you? Uh, answer it, will you, old boy? All right. Larry here. Oh, all right. Well, send me down here at once, please. What is it? Report from the laboratory. They're sending it down. Report from the Pathological Laboratory, Scotland Yard, delivered to Inspector Lowe, Tuesday, 11th May, 1948. Reference 498-MR381. The body found in the trunk is that of a Caucasian female about 40 years of age. Black hair and eyes, perfect teeth, height 5 feet 1 inch, weight 104 pounds when alive. Bruise on back of head, not cause of death. Oh. Bruises and superficial abrasions caused by fingernails on neck. Sure, okay. Well, preliminary examination indicates death caused by manual strangulation. Okay. Outer garments missing. Body clad in undervest bearing laundry mark 316 ADFA. Black nylon stockings, new, size six and a half. Body wrapped in cotton dust, a slightly stained with blood, same type, type OA. That found on neck. Body removed to mortuary. Please advise disposition of other articles. See Schedule A attached. Huh. Pathology laboratory, please. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Flannery. Hold it a sec, please. Inspector Lowe here. What is it, John? I finally made out the printing on that label. And? Neville Hutchins, second-hand articles, Brixton. Nip off and see the fellow. Does remember the man who bought it and all that, you know? Best go at once. All right, sir. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry. Who is it? Gwyn? Look, Gwyn, suppose you take the fingerprints of the lady from the trunk and pass them onto the print file at once. Perhaps we can discover who she was. Oh, you have done that. Good, good. She might have been one of our former customers. After all, really nice girls aren't often found in trunks, are they? Thanks, Gwyn. Ask them to let me know, will you? Thanks. Oh, uh, and get photographs of those laundry marks checked with our list, too, will you? You have done so. Well, I shall buy you a beer one of these days, Gwyn. Over and out. Ah, three irons turning a dull red in fire. Fingerprints, label, laundry mark. Not bad, Inspector Lowe. Not too bad at all. Conversation between Detective Sergeant Sean Flannery and shopkeeper Neville Hutchins at the latter's shop in Brixton. I'm Detective Sergeant Flannery of Scotland Yard, Mr. Hutchins. Well, uh, what do you want? You carry second-hand luggage in stock, sir? Well, what if I do? Trunks, perhaps? If you're looking for stolen goods, I don't know anything about any. Anyway, I haven't got any trunks. I shall last one I had something more than a week ago. Indeed. In bloody deed. Uh, so what? The ancient black leather one? Well, how do you know? Well, we found it. You, where? I should say that's none of your business at present. That's the one they found the body in at Charing Cross? How do you know? Well, I read the papers. Well, the Oskins had half a column about it in today's Express. Ah, uh, that's the one. Well, how do you know? It's your label. No. When did he sell it? Oh, let me look. Yeah, here we are, here we are. May the 2nd. You got the buyer's name? Now, this ain't sausages, mate. You remember what he looked like? Well, he was tall uh, and thin. Complexion? Dark hair, dark eyes. Dressed? Yeah, I don't remember that. What, did he do it, you think? Would you recognize him again? Well, of course I would. If he walked in here a year from today, tall, thin, dark. Well, we may ask you to identify him. Thank you. You're, of course, to say nothing whatever at this call. Now, oh, look here, Mr. Ray. If you do, we shall be very seriously annoyed with you, Hutchins. I've got nothing to conceal. I'm an honest man. And if your tall, thin, dark man hears of it, you might just find yourself inside a trunk one day. Yes. Just mind your eye, Mr. Hutchins. <laughs> I shall be seeing you again. Yeah. Good day, sir. Report of the Fingerprint Division, Scotland Yard, to Inspector Lowe. Uh, no record at all, sir, of the prints. None at all, eh? Uh, none whatever, sir. Uh, shall we continue our search? Interpol, the provincial police, the American FBI? No, not until I ask you. That'll do for the present, thank you. The laundry marks on the dead woman's clothing were identified by a laundry in Shepherd's Bush as having been issued to a family named Fanshawe, 
Further inquiry disclosed the fact that Mrs. Veronica Fanshawe, the only woman member of the family, was alive and well. She was summoned to Scotland Yard by Inspector Lowe. These are your laundry marks, then? No doubt about it. But the clothing's not mine. That I'm quite certain of. Yes, I'm sure they wouldn't fit you. They're very small. They're very cheap, obviously. Vulgar. I should never wear things like those. Have you any idea how your laundry mark could... Oh, no idea. Unless... Unless what, madam? We had a cook housekeeper a short time ago. She was one of those tiny women. And where is she? What was her name? Her name is Leonie Fournier. She's French. Is she still in your employ, Mrs. Fanshawe? She is not. I discharged her more than a week ago. I don't know where she is. Why did you discharge her? I did not approve of her. She'd been divorced and, well, you know, these French women. Besides, she was the most unsatisfactory housekeeper. I see. You disliked her a great deal. I... I disapproved of her. Will you come with me a moment, please, Mrs. Fanchon? Why, whatever for? Will you come with me, please? Where are we going? If you'll follow me, please. What is this place? This table here, if you please. <coughs> is this awful smell? This is our mortuary, Mrs. Fanshawe. Did you ever see this woman before? <coughs> It's Leone. Your former housekeeper? <laughs> I always knew she'd come to this. Thank you, Mrs. Fanchon. Other visitors to Inspector Lowe's office, Scotland Yard, between 12th May and 15th May 1948. Bus conductor Simon Norwich of Hounsditch. I was reading in the paper, sir, about this here black trunk the bloke murdered the woman in. All right, I did, sir. Well, see, you know, there was a fellow got on my bus at Brixton. The afternoon about the 4th of the month. He had a large black trunk with him. Ah? Uh-huh. You know, I was half a not to leave him aboard, sir. But the bus was empty, and I says to myself, poor son. Oh, with that great big heavy thing, so I let him on. Though it is against the rule. Heavy, you said. Well, not heavy after all, sir. Bulk is the word, but it was big and black and old-fashioned, like a piper says. Would you recognize him again, Norris? The only thing I remember about him is he had dog black hair, sir. Where did he get off your bus? Oh, I remember that, sir. Rochester Row in Westminster. I helped him off the trunk. The last I see was him staggering down Rochester Row with his great oak and black trunk on his up in the rain. Say, was he the murderer, sir? Rafe Dibble, taxi driver of Clarkenwell Road. The garage sent me, sir. They said they had a notice from Scotland Yard asking about any driver that had a fare to Charing Cross Station on Monday the 10th who had a large trunk as luggage. Had you such a fare? Yes, sir, I did. Would that be the murder trunk locked in all the papers, sir? Where did you pick up this fare, uh, Dibble? It was a very heavy trunk, sir. The gentleman says it's full of books, sir. Books, I says, feels more like a dead body, sir, I says. And he just snickered. So I roped it onto the luggage rack and took it to Charing Cross. My books, he says. Dead body, I says. And that's what it was, wasn't it? Where did you pick him up? Oh, in the rain, sir. At Rochester Row, right across the street from Westminster Police Station. See? Here's my trip card. Rochester Row. If he's the murderer, sir, I'd know him in a minute. He was tall and thin and had black hair, like an Italian or an Irishman. Tracy of case number 498MR381, 13th May 1948, compiled by Inspector Lowe and Detective Sergeant Flannery, 14th May 1948. Mrs. Fanshawe, number one. Her antipathy toward victim, highly suspicious, watching her closely. Two. Hutchins, the shopkeeper. Uncooperative, but possible suspect. Is this a pastor, please? All right. Description vaguely like that of unknown suspect. Tall, thin, dark-haired, under constant observation. Myself. Number three. Bus conductor Norwich and taxi driver Dibble state they can identify suspect. Have they seen the shopkeeper Hutchins yet, son? Take Take them over there tomorrow, sir. Good. Number four, now the victim. No apparent police record. No fingerprint record in our files. Meager reports on... uh, Yes, meager. Reports on her indicate she was quiet, industrious, and of comparatively good deportment, regardless of Mrs. Henshaw's opinion of her. Well, how about the Rochester Row coincidence, sir? Yes, 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 of course. Number five. Bus conductor says man with trunk alighted at Rochester Row with empty trunk. Taxi driver says he picked up man with heavy trunk at Rochester Row. Detail of constables and detectives under Inspector North commencing search of all buildings in Rochester Row. Very short street. Better put down that Sybil tomorrow. Results will be reported. I think that's about all at the moment, isn't it? 
Uh, all I can think of, sir. Very well, Sybil. Finish typing it and I'll sign it. Yes, sir. At eight o'clock the next morning, Inspector North and his detail of 20 detectives and constables arrived in Rochester Row with a Scotland Yard lorry fetching the trunk, carefully covered with a tarpaulin so that it could be exhibited to the tenants for their identification. Followed by the lorry, they went from house to house, questioning every inhabitant. At six in the evening, when operations were suspended, the trunk had not been recognized. The next morning at 10.15, Inspector North telephoned me, asked me to come at once to 9A Rochester Row on the fourth floor of a business building. I puffed my way up the four flights of ancient moldy stairs 20 minutes later. Ah. Oh. Ah, oh, hello. Ah. Uh, what's up, North? Uh, North, this is Mr. Henry Elvinson. Inspector Lowe. How do you know? Good morning, Inspector. I was saying to Inspector North that I recognized the trunk at once. Good, good. I want to sit down. Before you fall down, old chap, well, here you are, here you are. Now, uh, go on, go on. Uh, um, oh, um, I-, I saw it in the hall outside this room one day last week. Ah, uh, I was right. Whose room was this? Well, unfortunately, I'd never seen him. My assistant rented this place to him on April the 11th. His name, Arthur Cunningham. Where is he? Skipped. What? He left without notice. The sixth Thursday, that was. What was his business? Well, an estate agent, he said. Left this note on the table there. I got it out of our files. Uh, sorry, gone broke. Paid up to 11th. Please let typewriter people have a machine. Arthur L. Cunningham. Who has been and gone and hopped it. You know, North, there must be another way of making a living. I can give you the name of his bank. You should be able to find him quite quickly through them, sir. Oh, most excellent man, Elphinstone. Now, who will carry me down four flights of stairs to a telephone? At the Camberwell address furnished by Cunningham's bank, the landlady reported to Inspector Lowe that Cunningham had left the place on the 5th, leaving no forwarding address. But she remembered a letter addressed to Cunningham had been delivered to the house two days after he had departed. She gave the unopened letter to the inspector, who opened it legally at Scotland Yard and read it eagerly. It was a form letter from the post office telegraphs department. We regret that your telegram, dated 3rd of May, to Mrs. Harriet Cunningham, Greyhound Hotel, Hammersmith, was undeliverable because... Aha! Hello here. Put me through to Hammersmith, the Greyhound Hotel, Mrs. Harriet Cunningham, at once. I'll wait, yes. The innocent Mrs. Cunningham was only too glad to tell the inquiring friend where her husband was to be found, of course. The Hammersmith police picked him up in a pub that night, and the next day he confronted Inspector Lowe at Scotland Yard. He was quite at ease. Uh, No, I'm sorry, I never saw the woman before. (laughs) You know, I'm that old-fashioned character faithful to my wife, Inspector. Well, that's very commendable, I'm sure. Well, I admit I've been about the country a bit since I was demobbed last year, but I assure you all my travels have been quest of that elusive thing, a job. I gather they're rather difficult to come by. I found it, sir. I I thought I had a good thing in this estate agent business, but I found myself possessed of nothing but my affair to Hammersmith to my wife. Fortunate she has a good job at the Greyhound there. Wonderful woman, Harriet. It was her ninepence I was buying my gin and it with at the pub where chaps found me. Um, you say you did see that trunk at the place in Rochester Row? Uh, Yes, I think I'd seen it. I didn't take any special notes of it. It's a horrible thing. Quite. Well, you've been quite open with me, and I appreciate it, Mr. Cunningham. You won't mind if I check up on the statements you've made? Oh, of course not, of course not. I have nothing at all to conceal. Just as a matter of formality, do you mind having those two chaps who said they'd remember the man with the trunk, the shopkeeper and the taxi driver? Do you mind having them look you over? Oh, of course not. I I do think, though, that you should parade one or two others with me to see if they can vote for one. Uh, Isn't that the proper procedure in detective circles? Of course, I'll see to that. If I get them now and bring in one or two others to stand inspection with you... Oh, well, let's get it over with, by all means. I'll get them all at once, then. All right, on with the show. Oh, excuse me, sir. Flannery, go on in. You can help me. I'm just... Just a minute, sir. I was checking on relatives of the uh, murdered woman. Yes, yes, in a moment. This is her former husband. Afternoon, sir. You were married to Leonie Fournier? Yes, sir. Have you been in the mortuary? We just came from there, sir. He recognized her. Bloody awful, sir. I... Tell the inspector why you divorced her. Oh, I didn't divorce her. I just left her. Tell the inspector why. Well, she was running around with another man. Tell the inspector his name. Arthur Cunningham, sir. <laughs> 
I was very happy as I ushered Sergeant Flannery, Sergeant Anstruther, Inspector North, and Constable Fletcher into my office. Stand along the wall there, I said, in the bright light with Mr. Cunningham. I picked up the telephone. Will you please send in those three men in the waiting room? Come in, gentlemen. Now, if you will look at this group of gentlemen very carefully, please, and tell me if you recognize one of them as the man you saw with the black trunk. Now, take your time. Yes, Mr. Hutchins, you sold a man the trunk. Is he present? I don't see him. Are you sure? Positive. Well, you assured me you could recognize him. Not one of these. Mr. Norwich, do you recognize the man who boarded your bus with the trunk? Well, that, that tall one with the glasses. That's Inspector North. Well, I bet I don't have any idea, sir. You devil. Is the man who hailed your cab among these gentlemen? No, sir. He had a moustache. Nobody here's got a moustache. Yeah, that's right. You're certain that you do not identify any of these men? Well, then I take it, Inspector, that none of us are criminals, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. All of you. Inspector Lowe's office, 11.30 that night, only one lonesome light burning. The two men silent, thinking. Oh, must you always be liking that stinking pipe? Huh? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, Sean, I didn't mean to speak so sharply. I know. I'm just as upset as you are. I was so sure. Teach me a lesson, I hope. Well, those chaps were so certain they could identify him. They couldn't. The taxi driver. I talked to him afterwards. That tall chap, he says. He, he might have been the one, except he hadn't no moustache. I know. And his hair was the wrong color. A man can shave off a moustache. Yes, and dye his hair. Dye black hair? Well, you can make it lighter. I suppose. Well, I don't know whether Cunningham did it or not. But I'm definitely of the opinion that the murder was committed in that place in Rochester Row where the trunk was. An ideal setup for a murder. Tenant gone, place empty. The renting agent, that Elphinstone chap. Why, he didn't even miss Cunningham till the next morning. The woman's husband said that she'd been running around with Cunningham. Or she might have gone there to him and found him gone. Friend husband could have been following her. Caught her and cracked her neck. By crikey. He was tall and thin. He had dark hair and a mustache. Well. <sighs> we're not in such bad shape after all. Look, North and his crew are over there at Rochester Road taking the place apart. Brick. By brick. They're going to work all night and perhaps they'll find something. I devoutly hope so. Anyway, I'll have this husband fellow picked up and printed in case he left any marks of his paddies about over there. Well, we'll and start then... all over again. I'll go home and get a night's sleep and we'll have our little group of talented identifiers in here early in the morning to tell us that's our boy. You know, you're an extremely clever man, Sergeant Flannery. Oh, I'll have them all here first thing. Yes, Inspector Lowe? Who? Oh, yes, Mac. Well, we were just leaving, but... Oh, not really. Of course we'll wait. Come on down. Mac, up in the laboratory. Says he's been working on the contents of the trunk. Oh, not the late Mrs. Fournier, the other things. He wants to show us something. Did he say what? I didn't give him a chance. He's fetching it down to us, whatever it is. Well, I hope he hurries. Come in. Hello, Mac. Glad I caught you. It's just enough chance, but uh, what have you got? What have you got? Well, uh, this is the duster that was in the trunk uh, with a late lamented. Hmm. That looks awfully clean. Oh, I just washed it. I want the blood stains. Uh, look here under the light. Here, you see it in the corner? The blood stains covered it up before, and it's uh, pretty faded. Yeah. Greyhound Hotel, Hammersmith. The hotel where Cunningham's wife works. Is it important, Inspector? It's rather small for a hangman's new smack, old boy, but I fancy it will serve. It will serve. Now, Sean, you get friend Cunningham out of his comfortable bed at about the time Dawn is mucking about with rosy fingers. And you grasp Mr. Cunningham between the thumb and forefinger of the right hand and fetch him here to the waiting room. And watch him wait. Till I consent at last to see him. Yes, sir. And then watch her. And then you and I'll make a short visit to the mortuary. What for? To see if the unfortunate lady on the slab is in there is still smiling. Seven fifteen the next morning, a rather tousled, blear eyed Cunningham arrived at Scotland Yard with Sergeant Flannery and was seated to wait for my arrival. 
When I arrived at 9.30, he stopped me. What's up now, Inspector? Oh, just wanted to talk some things over with you. See you in a few minutes. Uh, but look, I've not had my breakfast. Well, I'll be with you in just a few moments. Oh, Inspector Lowe. Oh, yes, North. I've, uh, I've something for you to look at at once. Just wait a bit, Cunningham. I'm sure you don't mind. Uh, but, Inspector, what, what do you want? Nice going, North, I said. <laughs> a very good act. But North looked at me quite seriously. Not an act, Bob, he said. We found something. He handed me a little bottle cap. What's this, I asked. Read it. We found it in the fireplace of Cunningham's place last night, alongside these hairpins. Now, you read what it says on the bottle cap. Madame du Maurier's golden hair rinse. Why, North, I think Mr. Cunningham will be delighted to see that, after he's waited and sweated another hour or two. I let him in after two more hours. I'm afraid he was a rather pitiable sight. Flannery's cryptic remark to him as he passed by, something about new evidence, had ruined his sorely tried composure. And the waiting and speculating and wondering. I let him speak first. I I decided I'd better tell you the truth, Inspector. I let him wait. What I would like to know is uh, this. I did kill her. Uh, but it, it was accidental. I, I didn't mean to do it. It, it. it was purely an accident. She came to my room. You did know her, then? Uh, I, I knew her slightly. She came to my rooms, and, and she demanded money, and she threatened me when I told her I had none. How did she threaten you? I... How did she threaten you? Uh, she, she struck at me, and I automatically uh, struck back, and, and she fell and hit her forehead on the fender of the fireplace, and then... Wait, wait, wait. The bruise was on the back of her head. Uh, and I got, got panicky, and I, I stuffed her body in a trunk. When did you bleach your hair? What? what? Uh, but I tell you, I didn't murder her. I killed her accidentally, I tell you, accidentally. Listen to me, Cunningham, before you say any more. What, what? Arthur Cunningham, I arrest you on a charge of willful murder. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and used in evidence against you. Now, go on with your story, if you like. The crime... Cunningham's admission at the trial that he had lured his former inamorata to his office to put an end to her threats of exposure, together with his eventual identification by the shopkeeper, taxi driver, and the bus conductor, the stolen duster from the Hammersmith Hotel in which the body was wrapped, and other evidence produced by Scotland Yard were of great importance at his trial. The verdict. <coughs> My lord, we, the jury, find the prisoner guilty of willful murder. The sentence. <laughs> to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. You have heard the true story of Scotland Yard case number 498MR381. The names of all participants have been changed for obvious reasons. The research on Whitehall 1212 is done by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Quick, let me. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the Scotland Yard file by special permission of Commissioner Sir Harold Scott. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research has been done by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in case number 201-MR340. Sidney Patterson, builder. Mr. Patterson is absent, sir. 
Detective Inspector Edmund Whitaker of Scotland Yard. It was quite obvious why Mr. Patterson was absent. There are other participants in our case number 201-MR-340, but not of the same importance as Mr. Patterson. We shall run across them as we go on. We shall run across a great many interesting things as we reenact case 201-MR-340. And I should like to warn you, if you have the slightest trace of murder in your heart, that a murdered person's teeth are almost impossible to destroy, and that nothing is ever lost, and will certainly be found sometime, somewhere, by someone. Now, will you come with me? This is Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Yes? It's Inspector Whitaker, sir, with a friend. Oh, do come in, Whitaker. Thank you, sir. Come along. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, the curator of the Black Museum. Well, how do you do? I'm afraid this place is a little like a chamber of horrors, although our exhibits taken by themselves are not so startling. But they are souvenirs of the lawbreaker's art, particularly of the unlovely art of murder. Now, this human bone here brought one man to the hangman's expert hands. And these dried blood stains on this cloth are from a once-loving husband's throat. And this revolver... Oh, but you wanted to see the exhibits now, case 201-MR-340, didn't you, Whitaker? Yes, if you please, sir. Well, these are the only ones we had. There's a man's tooth and this badly charred top of an ordinary office stool. And that's all we have here of case 201-MR-340. The rest is elsewhere. Detective Sergeant Alexander McMurphy and I, we were the murder squad next on call, were sitting peacefully chatting in my office at Scotland Yard that evening of the 16th May, waiting for our relief, who were due in less than half an hour. Oh, you're early, Anson. No such luck, Mark. Oh, hello, Boots. What's up, Boots? Investigation, sir. Why couldn't I wait another half hour? Sorry, sir, it just came in. Uh, we don't live right. Camden Town, sir. Mm. There's a fire. What? They want someone from the yard. What are we, a bleeding auxiliary fire brigade, do they think? They seem to have come across someone sitting in the middle of it, sir. What? Sitting in it? Grilled to a turn. What? Mm. Here's the address, sir. Your car's waiting. We hastened at once, of course, to the Camden Town location, about 20 miles away. The fire was a small one. It had partially destroyed an old shed which had been used as an office by a local builder, Mr. Sidney Patterson. It was only a smoldering ruin when we arrived and identified ourselves to the magnificently moustached section leader in charge. We followed him into the soggy ruins of the shed. Right here, gentlemen. We wetted him down with the fire hoses as soon as we saw him, but it was much too late. Hot fire? Oh, ruddy and fennel. Mm -hmm. He had paints and oil stored in here. <laughs> Not my idea of a way to commit suicide. Suicide? Note on the table there. What was a table? Into the top with a drawing pin. Hey. Yes. Hold up your torch here a sec, will you, section leader? Yeah. Uh, good. Goodbye. Oh. No work. No money. Sydney R. Uh, Patterson. That was the poor sod's name. See the sign? I'll telephone the laboratory to pick up the uh, remains, shall I, sir? Best use the two-way wireless on the car, I think. All right, sir. What's he, uh, what's he leaning against? Looks like a stool or something. Uh, that's what it is, sir. A office stool. See these buckets all around him? He must have surrounded himself with buckets of paint and whatnot. And flipped a match into one of them. You ever hear of a chap committing suicide by setting himself on fire before. No, oh, I wouldn't want to. It's an awful well, horrible. Well, don't touch him. Well, I was only trying to pull him away from the stool here. Part of him ain't burned, see? Where he's don't, stuck to it. Don't, don't. Laboratory chapel, oh, Peter. Blimey. Hmm? Setting himself on fire didn't hurt him. What do you mean? He shot himself first. Did you see the bullet hole in his back where it ain't burned? When it was against the stool? In his back? Oh, was the man a contortionist? No, sir. He was a builder, sir. At the Yard's pathological laboratories, the relatively small, unburned portion of the body was carefully examined, and it was established that the bullet wound was the probable cause of death. The bullet, which was recovered, proved to be a thirty-eight caliber revolver bullet, 
which had been fired into the body from the back, entering just below the left shoulder blade and ranging downward, presumably through the heart. Experiments by all of us demonstrated to our satisfaction that such a wound could not possibly be self-inflicted. The improbable suicide was definitely murder. I sent two detective constables to search the ruins of the chain. It had been roped off at our request by the Camden Town Fire Brigade. You'll be looking primarily for a revolver, I told them, but fetch back anything you find that appears useful to us. Whilst they were shifting the ashes, Sergeant McMurphy sifted the affairs of Mr. Sidney Patterson. He reported to me what he had found. From the little I've been able to gather, Patterson wasn't much of a success as a builder, sir. He seems to have been a genius for getting into difficulty. What sort of difficulty? Money. Hmm. How strikingly unusual. Huh? Oh, he had one time been a ship's captain on one of the P&O liners, but was discharged when he was unable to account for tools to the value of eight pounds eleven shillings. Mm -hmm. It was strongly suspected he sold them, but the charges couldn't be proved. He served in the Royal Marine Light Infantry as a lance corporal. His record is, um, shall I say, dubious. How dubious? He was accused of a, num a number of times by his shipmates of cheating, specifically at the game of crown and anchor. <laughs> he was extremely unpopular in the Royal Marines, it seems, and was finally discharged. Mm -hmm. I shall have a more detailed report from his former commanding officer tomorrow. You hadn't any friends at all? I've been able to discover only one with whom he could be said to be reasonably friendly, a man named Duncan Fraser a rent collector in the city with whom he frequently played billiards. Mm, I hope he didn't make the mistake of trying to cheat a Scotsman. I'm not so sure, sir. Eh? Duncan Fraser has been missing since the night of the fire. The hue and cry was immediately set up throughout all Britain for the missing Duncan Fraser. It's extremely difficult for a British subject to leave our tight little island without record. But the search was no avail whatever. It apparently dropped off the earth. The constables applied to the ash sifting at the scene of the fire found only one thing of note. The twisted remains of an ornate red and black fountain pen, which was identified by his wife as Sidney Patterson's property. Careful examination showed that it was the pen with which the farewell note had been written and comparisons with other known samples of Patterson's handwriting demonstrated that it had been actually written by Patterson himself. Sergeant McMurphy and I were extremely glum as we discussed our progress in my office late one night. Progress, indeed. We've been progressing backwards, sir. Yeah, if we could find the revolver, it would be quite simple to trace its owner. If the owner is Duncan Fraser, we'll still have to trace him. Mm -hmm. No luck yet. None at all, at all. You know, sir... One thing puzzles me. A great many things puzzle me, Mac. If this missing rent collector did murder Patterson, why did he first deposit half the money he'd, be co he'd collected? In the bank, I mean. Hmm? If he was going to kill someone and, and scram, why didn't he keep it all? He'd need it. How did he get Patterson to write his own suicide note? Had a gun on him, maybe. Well, the handwriting, Wallace, insists there's no indication of stress or strain or emotional upset or whatever. In the handwriting. It's normal, they say. Mm. I wonder... What? Ah, uh, I'm thinking. I have a filthy little hunch, Mac. What? What if Fraser's dead? If he is, we can't find him. The teeth of that dead are weren't destroyed. Patterson's? I'm wondering if it was Patterson's. Or Duncan, Mac. Mm. Patterson was a, was a known crook. Could he have been playing games with us? Show me that telephone, old boy. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Patterson. Uh, Detective Inspector Whitaker, Scotland Yard here. I wonder, Mrs. Patterson, if you could tell us the name of your late husband's dentist. Thank you very much indeed. No, Mrs. Patterson, I'm afraid we've nothing to report yet. Get this tooth merchant in here first thing in the morning, will you, Mac? We'll meet him in the laboratory and let him look at our client's fangs.
Well? Well, what, Doctor? I never saw these teeth in my life. What? Oh. I can assure you they are not Sidney Patterson. You can swear to that, Doctor? Well, I hope you're not impugning my professional judgment, sir. Well, not at all, Doctor. It's a, it's a matter of correct legal procedure. I have ample records in my office which you may consult. Charts, impressions. Sidney Patterson had lost three teeth a long time ago. I extracted the left upper canine and the adjacent incisor myself more than a year ago. Mm. You'll observe that both teeth are intact in this jaw, sir. Then you're prepared to swear that these teeth are not Sidney Patterson's, sir? I most assuredly am. And that this is not Sidney Patterson's body? Since the jaw containing the teeth is attached to the remainder of the body, I'm prepared, so to swear, sir. It's often impossible to grow a new head on a body. My fee will be one guinea. I will indent for it at once, Doctor. Good day, sir. Now, what did I do with my hat? Yeah, good day. Good, good day, day, Doctor. Doctor. I am sincerely glad the teeth are not inflammable, Mac. If more people knew that, there'd be fewer left to be called for corpses around here, sir. Right. Now, have you found Duncan Fraser's dentist yet? I at once caused a thorough investigation to be made throughout London and the vicinity of Perth in Scotland, where Fraser came from, to discover a dentist who had been employed professionally by him. The search was most thorough, although the combined efforts of Scotland Yard and the provincial police were not efficient, sufficient to find the person. In the meantime, we were able to lay our hands on some uh, oh, 13 or 15 persons who had known either Patterson or Fraser. Each individually viewed the grisly remains in the Scotland Yard mortuary, and the result? I were young, Esquire, former employer of Duncan Fraser. Oh, it's hard to say, but I believe this to be the body of Fraser. Michael Fish, a former neighbor of Fraser. No, that ain't him. I know him well. Edgar Stone, brother-in-law of Patterson. I'm quite sure this is Sidney Patterson's body. And, sir, so that's the fountain pen I gave him. Artificer Sergeant Rodney Smith, Royal Marine Light Infantry, a former service acquaintance of Patterson's. No, that ain't him at all. Oh, and I wish it was. Bleeding stinker he was. No, but this ain't him. Police Constable Mark Emerson, a former billiards companion of Fraser. It's Duncan, all right. He looks awful. But then he always did. Hamish Fraser, uncle of Duncan. Oh, no. No, that isn't my nephew, Duncan. Samuel Furness, laborer, sometime employee of Sidney Patterson. I oh, know it's him. What well, didn't I work for him? Confusion. Confusion confounded. Six said it was Furness, seven insisted it was Fraser. Patterson's widow herself was not sure, and she and her brother, Edgar Stone, Patterson's brother in law, had high words. McMurphy and I nipped round to the goat and compasses to refresh and sustain ourselves. I was finishing my gin and bitters, and Mac was deep into his second pint of mild and bitter, when the proprietor, one Dick Gillespie, came out of the saloon bar and accosted us. Oh, I say, Inspector Whitaker, I didn't know you were in here. Yeah, hello, Dick. There was a, a telephone call for you. Oh, who was it? Uh, Sergeant Kenneth at the yard. What do you want? Well, he said, he said they'd found the dentist. <coughs> oh, 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 what's the matter, Inspector? Your teeth hurt you? It was a dentist from Perth. The Scottish police had found him. We brought him at once to Scotland Yard, where he immediately identified the charred remains as those of Duncan Fraser. One of his molars was curiously malformed. It corresponded exactly with the one shown in a clinical photograph of Fraser's mouth the doctor had made a year ago. There was no mistaking it, he said. We returned to my office to marshal the facts that we had accumulated. The labourer, Samuel Furness, who had been so certain of his identification of the body as that of Patterson, was waiting. Mac and I listened. Oh, I knew that was Mr. Patterson what burned up to a skeleton, sir. Why are you so sure, Furness? Because I was the last man to see him alive, sir. When? Well, in the afternoon of the day he was burned up, sir. Go on. Well, it was like this here, you see, sir. Go on, go on. Well, I come into his office, sir. You know, the shed, what was all burned up. 
I was after the seven and six he'd owed me for two months. Oh, he was always putting me off, sir, but... Why? Well, he, he always seemed to be stony, sir. Never seemed to have a shilling. Ah, he was always putting go me on, off. Go on, go on. Did you get your money? Oh, that I did, sir. Before you could say knife, he had out his purse and he pulled out a great wad of notes. Then he counted me out, me seven and six. And then he handed me half a crown. And he says, here, buy yourself half a pint, Sammy. <laughs> Cool, I was fair took her back at old Sydney giving anybody anything for nothing. He seemed to have <laughs> plenty of money, did he? Well, his wallet was fair stuff. <laughs> you know, it's the first time I ever known him to have more than threepence in my life. Oh. <laughs> well, I was so took back, I tried to get up and I fell right on my apple and plum. Yes. I kicked my foot against a couple of bags of cement he had under his desk and I fell right down. <laughs> did you see the bags of cement? Well, they was under the desk, sir. Did you see them? Well, I... Uh, well, no, sir, I did, but Thank I know I kicked you, and had plenty of money in his wallet for the first time. We found that there was absolutely no identification in the ruins of the burned shed that any cement had ever been stored there. We'll find him. I said that nothing is ever lost. No thing, no person. I will admit, however, that it is sometimes extremely difficult to find a missing thing or a missing person, especially when the objects of the search have few distinguishing characteristics. Sidney Patterson was such a man. Description of Sidney Patterson, broadcast by Scotland Yard. Age, 43. Height, 5 feet, 9 inches. Weight, 11 stone 4. Medium brown hair and straggling moustache, same colour, which he may have shaved off. Eyes, blue. When last seen, was dressed in grey tweed, single-breasted suit, white shirt, dark red tie, black low-cut shoes. How many men answering that description do you see in a day? We had reports from every corner of the United Kingdom. Two slightly addled gentlemen, neither of whom resemble Patterson in the slightest, marched, one at Torquay and one at Clanvar in Wales, into police stations, announcing themselves as the wanted man. Each was promptly committed. Lodging house keepers by the hundred were interviewed. The manhunt dragged on for eight days before we had our first glimmer of success. Um, let, uh, let McMurphy tell it. He was there. There was a lodging house in Regent's Park, a very obscure one which smelt of Brussels sprouts. The proprietress was in the hospital having another baby, and her husband, a very harassed man, was in charge. Yes, he said, they'd had a lodger who seemed to answer to the broadcast description. Had had, I said. Uh, well, he ain't here anymore, I mean. What became of him? Well, he opted. He opted the very day that the piper come out with the description. Where? I don't know. He, uh, he just sent us his telegram. Brother ill. Must leave. We'll get in touch later. Rogers. Rogers, eh? That the name he gave? Right here. Right here it is in the register book. Here. Sidney Rogers, see? Eh? Sidney, eh? That his own writing? Yes, yes. I'd like to have that page, if you please. Oh, I'll return it. You're sure it's his handwriting? Oh, I... I seen him. I, I seen him write it. May I have the page? Well... Well, my, my old lady likes to keep things neat and tidy. Mm, well, I'll return it as soon as we've checked it against a sample of his handwriting. Now, uh, when did he come here? Uh, 16th of May. It says right here. And when did he leave? Well, the day is his description first come out in the pipe. Mm, he leave uh, his luggage? Oh, he hadn't any luggage. He, he was here all the time without even, without even changing his shirt. That room of his, oh, it's fair piggish. <laughs> Must be. Well, <laughs> we're rid of him, and he's paid up till the end of the week. Anyway, so we don't lose nothing. Yeah. You you suppose it, it was him? It'll be in the papers. Comparisons of samples of Patterson's handwriting with the signature of <clears throat> Sidney Rogers showed them to be identical. Peterson's full name was Sidney Roger Patterson. The telegram had been sent from South End. We turned our attention to that muddy little place. He was not to be found. 
although our search was scrupulous and thorough. We put a postal stop on all letters addressed to his former home, expecting that sooner or later he'd attempt to write to his wife. Thus, all letters addressed to that house would be held out and delivered to us first. We would open and read them, reseal, and allow them to be delivered to the addressee without the wife's knowledge that we had read them. No letters appeared. We waited. Time was on our side, and the searchers at South End plodded along, making no apparent progress. And then, after a week had passed, the post office people sent us a letter. It was addressed to his brother-in-law, Edgar Stone, who had a room there. Letter addressed to Edgar Stone. Dear Edgar, just a line to you in the hope that I shall be able to see a friend before I end it all. Will you come to see me at South End Sunday, uh-huh. please? Take the 10.35 train. It arrives at South End at 12.08. Come out of the station, walk straight across the road and down Whitegate Road on the left side. I shall see you coming. If you come, please bring me a 15 and a half inch shirt and a comb. Best of luck. Mine is gone. F. Farmer. Well, so... I withdrew the detectives from the area mentioned in the letter, which was resealed and delivered to Edgar Stone. I didn't want to alarm Mr. Farmer Patterson. Next day, Edgar Stone came to see me. He sat down nervously. What can I do for you, sir? Stone asked. I... I I have received a letter, Inspector. Yes? It's from... Are you going to South End on Sunday, Mr. Stone? Uh Huh? Stone had a strong sense of justice, strengthened, perhaps, by the shabby way Patterson had treated his sister for so many years. He agreed at once to assist us. We sat in my office and planned it, Mac and Stone and I. You all taking the shirt, of course, Stone, I said. Yes, sir. What a man who's going to end it all once with a shirt is beyond me. Probably needs it. Afraid he'll be recognized if he goes out to buy one, I expect. He's got plenty of money, we know that. If the banks had been opened that afternoon... He, well, he'd, he'd have any. He wouldn't have any. What? Well, Fraser would have deposited his afternoon's collection, the same as he did his morning. Well, the banks had been open. Fraser would still be alive. Sydney would be up to some other mystery. Uh, yes. Well, let's get organized, shall we? First, we'll need a good man on this Whitegate Road to see Patterson doesn't get frightened into a bunk. You'd better do that, Mac. Well, uh... Oh, I'm afraid he'll spot you for a cop. Sky. Hmm? I've seen too many cinemas, I'm afraid. I don't like false beards. Wait. You play the fiddle, don't you, Mac? What? You could be a street fiddler, couldn't you? Well, I... I could. That's what you'll be. Complete with tin cup and pathetic look. Very touching and and very unsuspicious. And I'll have half of what you take in. How am I going to stop a man with a fiddle? Oh, simple enough, old boy. Just play God Save the King. He'll stand at attention till I get there. We planned it as carefully as we could. This was to be the definitive last act. Stone and I took the same train to South End, but when he got off with me, I stayed inside the station. Far down the street, I could see Sergeant McMurphy in an ancient green suit of clothes, sawing industriously away on his fiddle. There were a few pedestrians on the street. Church services were just over. There's Whitehead Road, I said to Stone. Come back at once. The up train's due in a few minutes. Good luck. I wish I didn't have to do this, Inspector, but... Just remember what he's done, Stone. It's the only reason I'm doing it, sir. Good luck. Sydney was my friend once. He turned and crossed the road, walked slowly down Whitehead Road. I watched him from the station window. As he approached McMurphy, he paused a second. I chuckled as McMurphy held out his tin cup and Stone dropped a coin into it. Far away, I could hear his fiddle. I went to the door of the station and stepped outside as he turned the far corner... There is such a thing as trusting a man, but... I waited. The distant street fiddler shambled round the corner which Stone had turned. I fidgeted. A couple passed on their way home from the church. I waited. A small boy ran past with a hockey stick. I waited. And at last I saw Mac Murphy in his green suit come slowly round the corner toward me. In a moment, Stone reappeared. He glanced at Mac as he passed, and I thought I saw him nod... I started toward him, sauntering quite casually. We passed without recognition. Mac had halted again and was playing. I stopped alongside him. 
How much have you made, Mac? I asked. Four shillings. Hmm, good. What happened? Oh, it's all right. Anybody who sees us will think I'm asking you how you fell to this lower state. First house round the corner. There was a cardboard sign in the window. Sydney was printed on it. Door opened. He went in. That's all I saw. Good. I'll nip round to the back. You walk on around in front and play. We'll see what happens. Well, I, I, I don't... I can't play, God save the king. It was easy to nip over the fence and slip around to the rear of the second house, which was marked J. Huntington. I tried the rear door. It was unlocked. I opened it cautiously and stepped inside. It was empty, apparently. I stepped down the narrow hall. Is that you, Mr. Huntington? I walked toward the voice. Mr. Huntington, is that you? I walked at the door on the left. Mr. Huntington. He stood there in the frosty little room, a pathetic figure with his neatly combed hair, holding a clean white shirt in his hand, an embarrassed little smile on his face. Oh, I thought you were Mr. Huntington. I'm Inspector Whitaker of Scotland Yard, Mr. Patterson. Oh, yes. I knew you'd find me eventually. I just wanted to put on a clean shirt before I... Before... Uh... I detain you on suspicion of being involved in the murder of Duncan Fraser. Poor Duncan. And I warn you that anything you may say will be taken down in writing and used against you. Uh, there. There we are. I've only one thing to say, sir. I did murder Duncan. This is the revolver I shot him with. Give it here. The one you couldn't find, sir. Give it here. It wasn't lost, sir. Give it here. Oh, no, sir. Patterson! No, sir, no. Nothing is ever lost. Supplies, I'm afraid. You have just heard the story of case number 201-MR-340 from the official files of Scotland Yard. All of the facts related are true, with the single exception of the names of the participants, which, for obvious reasons, have been changed. The research was prepared by Mr. Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the story for radio was written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two. Hurry. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These records are drawn from the Scotland Yard files, and only the names of the participants have been changed. The research has been prepared by Mr. Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter for the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Mr. Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in Scotland Yard case number 397-MR381. Stanley Russell, shop clerk. Mr. Russell is not to be found. Mrs. Hope Russell, his wife. Mrs. Russell was reported missing on the day before Good Friday. Adolf Hitler's Luftwaffe. <laughs> Chief Inspector Bryce Purcell of Scotland Yard. I should like to introduce Deputy Commander William Bird of Scotland Yard, my superior officer. Before we proceed, I believe it would be a good idea to visit the Black Museum. Come on with me, if you please. Please. 
After you, sir. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, sir. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard Black Museum. Well, how do you do? You came about case number 397-MR-381, I believe you said, sir. Right. Will you tell us about it, John? Well, this is the exhibit. No, don't touch it, please. It's quite fragile. And as you can see, it has already been broken. We have a great many other exhibits of crimes in these rooms. Murder weapons. Bloodstained garments. Bullets that have snuffed out many lives. Death masks and many notorious criminals. Almost every in instrument of violence that can be conceived. I should explain that these gruesome objects about us are not merely souvenirs. Many of them have aided our men in solving other crimes and bringing the perpetrators to justice. Now, this one... Tell us what this thing is, John. This is Mrs. Hope Russell. <laughs> Sixteen months after the Easter Blitz of 1941, the work of clearing out bombed-out areas of London was still progressing. On the 12th July 1942, the Scotland Yard Information Room received an urgent call from P.C. John Dunn of the Kennington District. A patrol car in which Chief Inspector Purcell was riding was dispatched to the scene, a partially destroyed Baptist chapel. I was directed to the spot by P.C. Dunn, who was on point duty at the road intersection. What right over there, sir, where you see the men standing. They found some it, sir. The navvies that's working here. Right, thank you. Morning, boys. Morning. What have you found? Who are you, mate? I'm Chief Inspector Purcell, Scotland Yard. What's up? Down, sir. Down there. In that hole, sir. Yeah, it's an old burying vault, sir. But what is it? A skeleton, sir. He's dead. Up down, George, and Sean, with your torch. All right. There you see, sir. Here he is. Stand to one side, will you? He's off under this stone slab, sir. Hmm. See? I see him. Well. What's so strange about a skeleton in a burial vault? There ain't been anybody in there since 1934, sir. 1935? Uh, I was in that gang that moved the old corpses out of here, Herbert. It was 1934. We didn't leave a one. <laughs> God bless you. It's quicklime down here, sir. Quicklime? How'd, uh, how'd quicklime get down there? You're the detective, mister. We just work here. The badly burned skeleton was removed to the pathological laboratories at Scotland Yard, together with the other articles found in the vault. A considerable amount of quicklime and a half-burned straw pellius which had partially covered the remains. There was nothing else. I stood beside Keith Briggs, the home office pathologist, while he completed his examination. What do you think, Keith? I asked. Well, she's dead. She? Well, it's a woman, all right. No question about that. The hip bones are characteristically a woman's. So is the sacrum here. And uh, well, how old a woman? Oh, middle aged, I'd say. See, the bones are fully developed, mm -hmm. so we know she was full grown. And there were one or two strands of long grey hair adhering to the skull. Here they are. And then the teeth here. What about them? Well, you see, they're pretty well worn. Now, you see here in the upper jaw, mm -hmm. seven of the uppers are missing. Now, oh. see these ridges? Yes. Now, they were caused by a dental plate, which probably consisted of seven teeth, and then... Uh, what are you looking for? The, the measuring tape. Oh, here. The lady was lying on it. What are you going to do now? Hmm, see how tall she was? She's rather jumbled about. Uh, and the, the feet, where are they? Oh, the thigh bones, all I need. Oh, hold it, please, huh? This one. Now, let's see... Let's see, uh, yeah, 43 centimeters. Well, that's all right, sir. Now, 43 centimeters multiplied by 3.6. What are you doing? A sediment scale. You multiply the length of the thigh bone by 3.6. Man's is 3.7. And you get the exact height. Now, 
See, that's uh, 154.8 centimeters. We'll call it 1 meter 55. Uh, meters 39.37 and 5500 of 39.37 is 21.65. Now, 39.37 plus 21.65, that's uh, 7, 5, 12, 6, 9, 10, 9, 10, 9, 9. 61.02 inches. Oh, yeah. She was 5 feet 1 and 200 inches tall. In a word, 5 foot 1. What was her name? Whatever her name, sir, she was murdered. Consider that I've asked the question. Eh? Oh, 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 how do I know? Well, this bone here. Where does it fit? This is what she talked with. It's the voice box, the trachea, you know, her throat. Look. See these little wing things up here? Mm -hmm. Oh, you see this one? See, it's broken. Well? Well, this is one of the most significant fractures in all forensic medicine, sir. Why? There's only one way to do it. Oh, come on, man. Don't come Sherlock Holmes on me. How do you do it? Well, I was about to say by manual pressure on the throat, sir. Strangulation, you mean? Intentional strangulation, sir. There's no other way. And then there's the quick lamp. <laughs> Surely you know that quicklime will not destroy a body, sir. Yes, I know it, Keith. But murderers seldom do. Reference to the ARP records showed that every other casualty and missing persons in Kennington had been accounted for. It was apparent that the victim had not been a resident of that district. I caused bulletins and charts of the teeth to be sent to all the dentists in London for identification. No results were forthcoming and we were forced to conclude that the dentist in question had become an air raid casualty, or that the work had been done in some other city. I gave Purcell a very difficult assignment. Difficult, sir? Well, it's not so difficult, but it's tedious. It'll take a long time. I know, but it's got to be done. I'm strongly of the opinion that it was murder. We checked carefully, sir, and the, the only quicklime on the entire premises was that in the vault with the skeleton. I thought they might have dusted the entire place with quicklime for sanitary purposes, but they hadn't. Certainly looks as if someone had wanted to dispose of a body. Until we know who she was, we'll never discover who he is. Ah, yes, sir. Well, I'll get cracking. I'll need men to go over the missing persons' rushes, sir, to find the names and addresses. Every woman five feet tall, of middle age with gray hair, who is still missing now. And then I'll need more men to make inquiries of all the next of kin to see which of them wore false teeth. And to find out which one wore an upper plate that matches the one in Briggs' chart here. Mm. It'll take a good many men and a good bit of time, sir. You can get the men, Purcell, and we've got the time. Good luck. Oh, thank you, sir. Nothing whatever happened for two weeks except for the unrewarded activities of Purcell's men. I had a minor inspiration about the seventh day. Put me through to Sergeant Bowles, please. Commander Baird here, Sergeant. I should like you to send me all the file copies of the Metro operations for the period two weeks before to two weeks after the Easter Blitz of last year, please. Yes, at once, if you please. The Metropolitan Informations is a daily newspaper containing digests of all the crime news. It is usually invaluable. I poured over every issue, looking assiduously for an item that might prove of some help. I had reached the end of the first week after the date the Kennington Chapel was destroyed, with no results whatever, when Purcell reported. Found, sir. Oh, good. Here. Here is the missing plate. Oh, that's much better than I'd hoped for, Purcell. Apparently the plate hurt her mouth. She often left it at home. As a matter of fact, I found it at her sister's. Oh? I stopped upstairs to see Keith Briggs in the laboratory, and they fit exactly, allowing for the fact that there's no flesh on the jawbones. But... Ah, here's Keith. Is that right, Keith? Mm, that's right, sir. And the marks on the skeleton's teeth coincide exactly with these little clamps here. I've uh, brought the skull down. Yeah. You see, sir? Oh, she looks very fine. Congratulations, Purcell. Thank you, sir. The only thing is, uh, she was reported missing three days before the raid that destroyed the chapel. She was? It's in all the records, sir. Where were you, madame? Oh, she might have been hidden in the vault. Immediately she was murdered, sir. 
And then the fire, when the place was bombed... It must have been quite a hot fire. Let's see. The Kennington Fire Brigade, please. Yes. Oh, what's her name, Purcell? Mrs. Hope Russell. Russell. Hope Russell, did you say... Oh, hello. Is that the Kennington Fire Brigade? The senior company officer, if you please. I'll wait. Hope Russell. I've run across that name somewhere. Yes? Thank you. Hello, this is Commander Bird at Scotland Yard. Do you remember during the Easter Blitz last year when the Baptist Chapel was destroyed there in Kennington? What I wanted to know was that a very severe fire... What? There was no fire. What? No fire, whatever, when the chapel was destroyed. Oh, two days later. Hmm, how very curious. It was reported by whom? The Kennington police. Or wasn't there a... Oh, look here, old chap. I'm sending at once for their divisional superintendent. Could you possibly come along with him to my office at the yard? Yes. I'm afraid it is rather important. I'll have him pick you up in his car. Thank you so much. At once, yes. No fire. Keith, would you mind? Get him in the fire chap over here at once. Use my name. Ask them both to bring their records for that night. Please. All right, sir. <coughs> no fire, eh? What's that woman's name, Purcell? Mrs. Hope Russell. I knew I remembered it. Look at this. Metro information, eh? Look under articles lost and found. I was just reading it. <sighs> lost and found. Here, the, the third item. Read that. Found by postmistress Guilford Surrey in the post office yesterday, a woman's purse. Black leather, plain, strap. Contents, lipstick, comb, mirror, two London tram tickets, Levenpence in coin, ration book, identity card, issued to Mrs. Hope Russell. Well, what was she doing in Guildford? Look at the date of the paper, Purcell. April? What was she doing in Guildford three days after the air raid in Kennington? <laughs> The divisional superintendent and the fire brigade officer from Kennington sat in my office with Purcell and me. I looked at the fire brigade records first. Now, here, sir, this is the day of the big raid when the chapel was destroyed. Good Friday evening, 11th of April, 1941. Yes. Every call is set down in the occurrence book here, sir. Yes, I know. Together with all the calls to the auxiliary fire service, the civilians, sir. Yes, I know. And you can see there's no report whatever of a fire at the Kennington Baptist Chapel from either source. Quite. But over here, sir, on this page, Tuesday the 15th, four days later, 11 o'clock p.m. You see, sir? Mm -hmm. Chapel and so forth. Report telephoned in by Kennington Police Station. Do your records correspond, Superintendent? I'll read it to you, sir. 10.57 p.m. Tuesday, 15th of April. P.C. Allison telephoned to report a fire at the ruins of the Baptist Chapel. Alarm telephone to Kennington Fire Brigade at 11 p.m. Your anger's up yourself, Robert. Well, I did that indeed. Here's my initial. What do you think, Purcell? Why did the police constable report it? Yes, I was just going to ask that. I don't understand, sir. Wasn't there a fire watcher? <laughs> Wasn't there? Well, sir, there, there was a fire watcher. There was supposed to be. Well, where was he? Asleep, sir, probably. Or out cadging a drink somewhere. Not an ARP man. No, sir. A private man employed by the wholesale chemists across the road from the chapel. A thoroughly useless man. Completely undependable. Yeah, his employers caught up with him at last, sir. He was sacked six or seven weeks ago. I've not seen him since. Neither do I. Well, sounds like a spiv to me. He is, sir. I knew him quite well. I had a great deal of trouble with his wife, and I used to see him quite regularly. Oh. He agreed to pay in 18 shillings and ninepence, I, I think it was, weekly, at the police station for her, which he didn't ever do. <gasps> Not ever. Never once till Easter Monday last year, right after the big raid. He kept it up till, till he was discharged and left. I suppose this chemical firm he worked for could put us on to him. I'd like to have a chat with the fellow. Wouldn't you, Purcell? I certainly would. I'll telephone them now and ask them if you'll give me the name of the firm and his name. Oh, his name is Stanley Russell. Russell? 
I wonder if you'd know his wife's name, Superintendent. Well, I've seen it often enough. Yes, yes, sir. His name, uh, her name is uh, Mrs. Hope Russell. <laughs> In the Pirates of Penzance, Gilbert and Sullivan complain bitterly that a policeman's lot is not a happy one. I subscribe most heartily to that sentiment. I would like you to hear Chief Inspector Purcell's report to me, just as he gave it, in my office. Well, Purcell, I said, did you find our Mr. Stanley Russell all right? Uh, not there. Well, you left men to wait for him, haven't you? Sir, I got the address of the place. Sergeant Hatton and I drove there in a yard car driven by Constable oh, Small. Oh, get on with it, man. The whole bloody place was gone, sir. Gone? The whole bloody block was destroyed. Destroyed by an enemy bomb in an air raid six months ago. One day after Russell moved in. Not one person in the whole building's been heard of since. <sighs> sir, I respectfully request permission to go somewhere and get howling drunk. You know, Purcell, I think I'll go with you. But we didn't. We sat quietly in Commander Bird's office and thought long, dark thoughts. After a while, Keith Briggs, the pathologist... Observing the light inside, stopped by, and almost at the same time, John Davidson from the Black Museum came in to see what was up. <laughs> Nothing's up, John, I said. On the contrary. What happened? Purcell was just telling Keith here. That chap is a blitz casualty. Did? And may God have mercy on his soul. Mm, I'd rather hope to hear a bloke in a black cap say that, Keith. I thought we had him, dead to rights. Oh, don't be so bloody American. I think we could have proved it. He strangled her, then hid her body in the vault, took her handbag to Guilford and lost it in the post office there. Cleverly putting Scotland Yard off the scent. Timing was a little bad. And then when the Blitz came... Tried quick line first, didn't work. Blitz came, and he set her fire. If, if he'd been a better fire watcher and not... Hiding a hole somewhere, he'd have known there was no fire that night. Yeah, but what a good fire watcher. He wasn't good at anything. I wonder. I wonder uh, what, John? What do you mean, John? Well, <clears throat> if I'd strangled my wife and burned her up, which God forbid, because I haven't one, <laughs> I'd be very happy to have people think I was dead. If I'd hear that my home was destroyed and everybody in it dead, I should be delighted. Most delighted. I changed my name. Not in wartime, you no, wouldn't. Say no, that's not. right. Identity cards and ration books. Absolutely. I'd forgotten. Getting new ones in the name of Harry Hawkins or Sam Small <laughs> oh, would be difficult. <laughs> but even Scotland Yard would stop looking for me if they thought I was dead. Wouldn't they, Commander Bird? And you'd go around buying new clothing and whatnot, if you could, and presenting your own ration book in your own name and... Where are you going, Purcell? I'm going to stagger home through the blackout, sir, with your permission. I have a large number of men's clothing stores to interview beginning tomorrow, and I'd like to get a good night's sleep. Good night, all. The Stanley Russell crop was enormous. Chief Inspector Purcell discovered that 200... Let me see. 234 of them had purchased clothing since the date our Stanley Russell had been reported dead by enemy action. But not one of them was the Stanley Russell we wanted. We made thorough inquiries of all his known acquaintances, all to no avail. The war office had no record of our man. We were reluctantly forced to the conclusion that he was dead, or the, that he had heard of our search for him and gone to ground most effectively, as I said to a rather haggard Purcell. Purcell shook his head. Ah, uh, I'd like to keep on looking, sir, if I may. I have a hunch that he'll turn up unexpectedly. It will certainly be unexpected so far as I'm concerned. I'd like to keep on trying, sir. Well, for a few weeks more, but I'm afraid... Commander Bird speaking. Yes, he's here. 
It's for you, Percival. Well, I'll I'll take it outside, sir. Please. No, don't take it here. Thank you, sir. Chief Inspector Percival here. Who is he? Oh. Well, I I I don't know him personally, but I know of him. Yes. Will you ask him to wait a moment? I'll ring you back. Sir. Yeah. I've never been so shocked in all my life. Oh, really? What's happened? Somebody dead? Somebody's alive. What? If I'd heard this on the radio, I wouldn't have believed it. Well, what's happened? Mr. Stanley Russell is calling on us. Well, Brother Purcell, let him enter and be received in due form. <laughs> Will you show Mr. Stanley Russell in, please? Thank you. You sound like a spider, Purcell. Thank you, sir. I feel I am. And a chair for our guest. <laughs> you think I sound like a spider? Come in. Mr. Stanley Russell, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. I, I was looking for Inspector Purcell. Come in, sir. I'm Chief Inspector Purcell. How do you do, sir? And this is Commander Bird. Good morning. Good morning, sir. May I sit down? Thank you. Does one smoke in here? Yes, by all means. Will you... Will you try an Abdullah? A tar. I'm afraid I always smoke vines. <laughs> now, I hear Scotland Yard is looking for me. That's... Uh, <clears throat> that's true. Why, may I ask? You've been extremely hard to find. Oh, I've been in the country. Derbyshire. We should have come there eventually. Oh, I've saved you the trouble. What do you want to see me about? You were a fire watcher, Mr. Russell, in Kennington. Yes. There was an unreported fire at the Baptist Chapel there whilst you were on duty. When? Two nights after the raid that destroyed the chapel. I didn't see any fire. Is that all you wanted? No, Mr. Russell. Well, I don't recall any fire, sir. You didn't see or hear the fire brigade? No, sir. Near 11 o'clock? Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I must admit I wasn't there. Where were you? I did see the fire brigade moving away when I came back, but... Where were you? Oh, I was out of cigarettes, and I strolled around the corner to see if I could borrow one or two from the fire watcher at post four. He says he never saw you, Mr. Russell. Oh, he's probably forgotten. It's a long time ago. He will swear he didn't see you that night. Well, the fire obviously didn't do any damage. A woman was burned to death in it. Murdered? Do you know anything about it? Of course not. I, I'm very sorry to hear that anything like that... The woman was your wife. May I have one of your cigarettes, please? Thanks. So that's what became of her. Do you know anything about it? I'm afraid I must disappoint you, gentlemen. I wasn't on very good terms with her. We know that. I'm afraid I've no tears for her. She was... Oh, well, she's dead now. I can't say anything. Naturally, I'm shocked. Naturally. I'm afraid I'm not sorry. Do you know anyone who would have had a motive for murdering her? You had a motive, didn't you, Mr. Russell? <laughs> I can see how you might think so, but I didn't murder her, I assure you. When did you last see her? I don't really remember. Several months before she was murdered, I think. How do you know she was murdered? Why, well, you said so. Did I? Oh, I would have had good cause to, Inspector, but I'd have been a fool to do it now, wouldn't I? Yes. Well, Mr. Russell, thank you for coming to see us. If there is anything else you remember, please come back and see us again. I think that's all for now. How can we find you if we need you? We may want your corroboration of certain facts. Well, I'll write down my address, sir. It's a sad affair, and you have our sympathy. Thank you, sir. I admit I'm terribly shocked. Of course. Well, here's the address and telephone number, sir. Thank you. Feel free to call on us at any time. Goodbye. Goodbye, gentlemen. I was merely trying to do my duty. Oh, you've done it admirably, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. 
Well, he's a liar. I know it. May I ask why you... Why I let him go? (laughs) He thinks he's got us completely fooled. He'll be back with more helpful information. Come in, Mr. Russell. Uh, I I just remembered something that might be of importance. Uh, Come in. I remembered that an old straw pelleus, uh, a mattress I used to catch 40 winks on, it was stolen about that time. Mm -hmm. Could that have been used to stop the fire? Did you find it? Yes, we found it. Oh, that's good. Well, I, I must go now. Oh, by the way, was the body destroyed by the quicklime? Yes. What's the matter? You are a very clever man, Mr. Russell. Much too clever for your own good. Why? Why, may I ask? No one had mentioned quicklime except you. Well, I thought... I mean, I I didn't, I wasn't even there. I I tell you, I didn't touch him. I said you were much too clever for your own good. You, you think I, I didn't strangle her? Go ahead, Chief Inspector. Stand no. Stand Russell, I arrest you on the charge of willful no, murder. I didn't do it. And I, I warn you that whatever no, you say will be taken no, down in writing no. and may be given in evidence. The crime. The painstaking evidence Scotland Yard had collected, together with Stanley Russell's own statements, were sufficient to convince a jury that he had murdered his wife, Hope Russell, and burned her body. All his allegations of misconduct on her part were proved completely false. It was demonstrated at the trial that he had planned the murder for a long time, and having found a convenient time and place, had committed it. The verdict. My lord, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty of willful murder. The sentence. Prisoner at the bar. Stand up. It is the sentence of this court that you be hanged by the neck until dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. You have heard the true story of case number 397MR381 from the files of Scotland Yard. The names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. Starting next week, Whitehall 1212 will be heard at a new time, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Research by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, stories for radio written and directed by Willis Cooper. Next, listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Whitehall 1212, quickly, please. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate records are drawn from the actual files of Scotland Yard. They're true in every respect, except for the names of the participants, which for obvious reasons have been changed. Research on the exclusive series has been done by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Some of the participants... Donald Rhodes, Chief Security Officer of Heathrow Airport and a former Scotland Yard man. It was a considerable responsibility. Detective Sergeant Vivian Morris of Scotland Yard. I am a suburban housewife. Chief Inspector Robert Sheehan of Scotland Yard's Flying Squad. Step into the Black Museum here with me. I should like to show you something. John? Is that you, Sheehan? Yes, I brought some friends to see you. Yeah, I'll be with you at once. Good afternoon. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of Scotland Yard's Black Museum. How do you do? Well, I expect you've come about the relics of the Heathrow affair. Right. Oh, on the table there behind you. All we have. Oh, good. Yes, this one I recognize. Iron bar used by criminals in Heathrow affair. (laughs) Some of my hair is still sticking to it. Yes, some of your blood too, Bob. Makes my head ache yet. Uh, this is a uh, briefcase carried by the GOC. 
And here, <clears throat> alterable license plate used by the GOC gang. You see, it reads GMU 436. Press the lever, please, John. Okay, presto. It reads CGC 829. Very neat, isn't it? You, of course, don't have the most important souvenir at all here, John. What's that? The half-million-pound sterling. I think that I should tell you a little about our flying squad. It consists of a large number of motor cars, all wireless equipped, all very fast, and all kept constantly in superb condition. The flying squad is on duty 24 hours a day, a highly mobile force available on extremely short notice at any point in the entire London area. The members of the flying squad are hand-picked, and they're very unusual men. These three are typical. This is the Sergeant Nobby Clark of the flying squad. Yes, sir. I was one of Lord Lewis's commanders. I was at Norby. Oh, yes, and at Gibb. Former leading petty officer Dusty Miller of HMS Phoebe. I am 29 years old. I am six foot two and I weigh 14 stone eight. I was welterweight champion of my ship, the light cruiser Phoebe. Detective Sergeant Ray Lawton, the Canadian. I, I'm about the, uh, the only policeman you ever heard of who was once a lion tamer. In a second. Like all policemen in Britain, we seldom carry arms. Although I assure you we're quite able to use them effectively should the occasion demand them. British policemen rely on the weapons provided by nature, augmented occasionally, of course, by the issue of stout truncheons or rubber cautions, which I understand the Americans call black jacks, and which are wondrously effective. Our job, you see, is not to shoot criminals, but to bring them to justice, or if possible, to prevent their depredations. We find our methods rather effective. Well, in June 1948, the great new London airport, London had long since outgrown the famous old Croydon Airdrome, was operating at capacity, although it was still far from completion. My old friend Donald Rhodes, a veteran Scotland Yard man who was chief security officer at Heathrow, came to call on me at the yard. Can't stay away from the old home place, can you, Donald, I asked. I always know where to come for help, Bob. What's the matter? You know the GOC? General officer commanding what? Ancient and honorable brigade of robbers. Oh, Moriarty? Moriarty, Townsend, Inge, Hughes, West, Simmons. Brown, Bennett, dozens of names. Yes, I know him. Or know him, I should say. Big operator. Biggest. Well, his recce people have been looking us over. What's he after? A nice new airplane for himself? Gold. At Heathrow? We transship thousands of pounds in gold, you know. International affairs. Planes fly in dripping with the stuff. Leave it overnight with us and... Leave it lying about? We keep it as short a time as possible in our bonded warehouse under guard. Strongest safes in the country. Guarded, of course. <laughs> Try and get past them. Much gold? Plane load at a time. How's he going to do it? Tanks or something at dawn? Oh, he'll be much more clever than that. He always has been. That's why he isn't sewing mailbags at Dartmoor today. How'd you get on to all this? I brought the chap along, one of my mechanics. Like to talk to him? Naturally. Come in, will you, Karen? Yes, sir. This is former Lieutenant John Karen of the Royal Tank Regiment, Bob. Good afternoon, sir. Sit down, Mr. Karen. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, tell Chief Inspector Sheehan about it, will you please, Karen? Well, sir, I've been with Mr. Rhodes for quite some time. The day before yesterday, I received a telephone call from an acquaintance of mine named Edward Mybridge. Where did you know this Mybridge before? We were in prison together, sir. Prison? Well, Mr. Hitler's off flag, 18 in the war. Oh, German prison camp. Yes, sir. I had seen him since we were demobbed and we had a drink together. Oh, let's not waste any time, please, Karen. Oh, no, sir. Well, he telephoned me again yesterday, sir, and... You had another drink? Right, sir. He asked me how I'd like to make a lot of money and the whiskey, and I said, fine. I asked how... He said, passing on some information about Heathrow, how it was run, and the guards, and all that. What sort of looking chap was he? Red hair, squint eye, limps on right leg. Sound familiar to you, Bob? Not as what you call him, Colonel. Edward Mybridge, sir? His name's Ginger Johnson in our books. Unmistakable. He's not a nice fellow at all, Colonel. I found that out, sir. Oh? He warned me to say nothing to anyone about our conversation, or he'd have to take steps. I remembered what he did to a German prison guard the day we were released, sir. What? 
Cut his head off with a mess knife. A very hard character indeed, this Edward Mybridge. Here is Ginger Johnson, an old Borstal boy. He had served honorably in the army, but had returned to his old ways immediately upon demobilization. He was well known to us as one of the GOC's most useful lieutenants. This GOC, a man of great mental attainments, we knew for the leader of one of the most desperate gangs of lawbreakers in all our experience. A genuine storybook mastermind. He had for many years operated like a real general officer commanding, maintaining a small staff of rough and ready assistants like Mybridge, and recruiting his actual operatives, his army, for specific jobs as he needed them. Scotland Yard had never been able to lay a finger on him, although he was quite well known to us under a variety of names and ostensible professions. It was obvious that this would be no small undertaking. He needed to be watched, and thoroughly, and beginning at once. I telegraphed a chief inspector I remembered in a Scottish town not far from Perth, and he reported to me at Scotland Yard the next day. I finished my briefing on what he had to do for us. Oh, I'll recognize him all right, sir. You have a lot of pictures of him. I wish we had him. I'm not to arrest him, sir. You'll not have a chance. He's a most law-abiding man. Now, he's never seen you in his life. And you understand, I don't want him to see you. Okay, sir. I'll want to know everywhere he goes, everyone he talks to. Aye, sir. Don't telephone in. Stay with him till you see him home in the evening. Then come in and report. Okay, sir. And good luck. You'll need it. I'm a very ordinary-looking man, sir. He'll never see me. Chief Inspector Ross was back in my office in two hours. Uh, <clears throat> well? He, uh, I was standing on the corner, sir, waiting for the bus with him. And just as it stopped, he turned to me and said, It's all right, Chief Inspector Andrew Ross. You can go back to Perthshire. I'm just going to my bank this time. A detective constable we imported from Leeds who looked like a clergyman was addressed pityingly by name by the GOC who trod on our man's toes. The language he employed was quite unclerical. The law, of course, does not permit tapping a suspected man's telephone, so we were forced to continue to try to trail him to find out precisely what he was doing. But infallibly, he recognized our people. Rhodes kept hounding us. He couldn't organize his plan to defend the airport until he knew more of the GOC's probable intentions, and the man outwitted us at every turn. There came a morning ten days or so later when I saw Vivian Morris, one of our women detective sergeants, pass my open door. Oh, uh, Sergeant, I called. Good morning, sir. Come in here a moment, will you? Uh, yes, sir. Vivian. Yes, sir. You're a very pretty girl. Why, thank you, sir. <laughs> Have you ever followed a man? <laughs> Report of Detective Sergeant Vivian C. Morris to Chief Inspector Sheehan at Scotland Yard. I don't think he recognized me, sir. You look like a young suburban mother, Vivian. I am. Got two girls. I shall send them each a hair ribbon. What happened? Oh, I got on his bus one street after him. There was no seat. I spotted him at once. He was staring about the bus, looking for one of us. And we were not there. All at once, he leaped to his feet and offered me his seat. The very mirror of politeness. Yes. Then he rushed to the door, leered at a perfectly innocent man in a Homburg hat, and leapt off the bus almost before it had stopped. I couldn't follow, of course. Naturally. But tomorrow is another day. Report of Detective Sergeant Morris the second day. Yes, sir. He stayed on the bus this time. I had my knitting with me. I'm doing a pair of tartan stockings for Sheila for her birthday. He didn't pay the slightest attention to me. He got off at Waterloo Station with most of the others on the bus, including myself. He went into a small tobacconist shop. Here's the address, sir. Thank you. He was wearing a dark blue coat, a bowler hat, and carried a small briefcase. I went into a lion's corner house, you know the one, sir, where I could watch the door of the tobacconist. I had three buns and three cups of coffee before he came out again, this time wearing a brown tweed suit and hat and without the briefcase. He looked about him sharply and hailed a taxi cab and they drove off. The number of the taxi cab was EBC 414. Thank you, Sergeant. Most well done. Would you just shove me the telephone, please? Thank you. There's an urgent telephone call waiting for you, sir. Who is it? Inspector Green of Traffic, sir. What does he want? He said it's quite important, sir. All right, put him on. Yes, Green? Uh, 
Green here, Shane. So I hear you're interested in Ginger Johnson. What about him? He's dead. I refuse to burst into tears. He was apparently struck by a motor car. Where? On the Great West Road near the New Heathrow Airport. Oh, was he killed instantly? Well, he lived only a few minutes after we picked him up. Well, he's out of our hair. Oh, uh, did he say anything? Uh, uh, just a sec. What must he say? He's a joker. Oh, say so perhaps you'd know what he was talking about. What did he say? He said, tell Karen not to drink the tea. It's poisoned. <laughs> Sounds quite macromerish, doesn't it? <laughs> You're sure he said, tell Karen? Did he say Karen? Yes, I don't Yeah, that's right, Karen. So I don't know any Karen. Quite all right, old boy. I do. Oh, uh... Thank you very much. I hung up on him. Is there anything I can do to help, sir? Yes, go out and get someone started on tracing that taxi cab at once, please. Here, take the paper with a number on it. Right, sir. Will you put me through to Heathrow Airport at once, Chief Security Officer? Oh, good, you're here, Bob. Oh, Donald, I was just telephoning you. Never mind, Officer, he's just come in. Look, Don, what about Colonel and the T? Eh? Ginger Johnson just got killed. His dying words were to tell your man, Kern, not to drink the tea because it's poisoned. Tea? What's it mean? I think he was off his rocker. Thought he was still in the German prison camp. Could be. What I came over for, I have a signal from the foreign office. The Americans are sending us some money soon. Much? Mere 388,000 pounds in gold. When? Ten days from today. Wonder if that's what the GOC is getting his sights on. A great many people knew that we were expecting a large amount of gold from America. He has a long nose. That long, do you suppose? You had a great deal of experience with him while you were here at the yard. I wonder. Oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, Come in, Vivian. You know Sergeant Morris, don't you, Donald? Indeed I do. How are the girls, Vivian? They're fine, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, They're checking the taxi driver, sir. They'll telephone you. Good. You can go home now, if you like. You want to try again tomorrow? Of course, sir. Good girl. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Rowe. Good night. What's what's she doing? She's caught up with the GOC. Find out anything good? Shortly. Look, we'll have to get going on this thing at once. If it is the the new shipment he's after. I know it. There's not much we can do until we have an idea how we intend to try. Pity Ginger Johnson died. He might have told us instead of babbling about poison tea in German prison. She in here? Shattinger here, sir. In the 999 room. Yes, Shattinger. And rather good luck on tracing that taxi cab, sir. Found the driver had just come into the company garage. Had his trip booked with him. Good. The uh, trip at 1023 this morning was from Waterloo Station to a shop in Sowell. A chemist shop. Sir. A chemist shop? Yes, sir. The taxi driver said he saw his fare enter the shop. George Schill, chemist, he said. George Schill, I know that man. What George, about George Schill, Schill has been involved in a number of narcotics cases. Yes, I know. Thank you very much. What about George Schill? That's who the GOC was visiting this morning. Is he in the narcotics thing, too? We shall find out, old boy. I wonder where he went from there. Probably to bump off Jim Johnson. Bump him off? Now tell me why he should do that. Well, good old Ginger might have been looking on the wine when it was red. Bible, old chap. Or the whiskey when it is amber. And blabbered about his talk with your man, Kern. The GLC wouldn't like that, would he? He wouldn't know whether Kern had talked to you. And he might have decided to prevent any more talk by Ginger to the wrong bloke. Ah, a little fantastic. But plausible. Where'd they find Ginger? Uncomfortably close to your precious airport on the Great West Road. Ah. Yes. Put it through to Superintendent Trevelyan. Is that you, Trevelyan? She in here. Look, sir, I'd like to have a detail of men at once on an investigating job. Yes, sir, most important. I'd like to have a check made at once of all houses along Great West Road near the New Heath Airport. I'll direct them if you like. Eh? Oh, thanks, Donald. Mr. Rhodes, the chief security officer at the airport, will help them out. I'm looking for a house that has a, a recent lodger check the houses that overlook the Air Force first. Please, for a lodger that did not return this evening. Here's the description. Tall, red-haired, has a squint eye and a gimpy right leg. Got it, sir? Thank you. Yes, sir, I'll get a search warrant and come at once when they find him. 
Thank you very much. They can telephone me at home if they find the place out of hours. Right. A few minutes after midnight, I was awakened by a telephone call from one of the men of Superintendent Trevelyan's squad. After some difficulty in obtaining a search warrant at that time of night, I proceeded to the house in which he had telephoned. The house was almost directly across the road from the main gate of the airport. Donald Rhodes, who was awaiting my arrival, accompanied me upstairs to the former lodger's room, which provided an excellent view of the airport from its single window. The householder turned on the lights and left us. The room was quite neat. There's, uh, there's a chair by the window. Yes. Turned towards the window. Cushions rumpled quite a bit. Somebody's been sitting on it a lot. Here's an officer's musette bag in the closet. Have a look. It's his, all right. See? E. Mybridge, Lieutenant, King's Royal Rifle Corps. Good regiment. He's a good soldier, I expect. Here's a drawer in the table. Ah. What? E. Lights, Wetzler. Good pair of glasses, these German officers. 10x30. He was spying. That's this. What's this? Royal Corps Signal Field Message Pad. Or his reports to the GOC, eh? <laughs> Quite regimental. Been using it, too. Good. What? Writing on the sheet he just tore out left an impression on the second sheet. Let's see. Hold up the lamp there, Donald. Mm -hmm. No, hold it so the light comes across the page from the edge, so it casts a shadow on the ridges of the writing here. Hmm? Read it. Hold the lamp still. See to guards at... at what's this word? Looks, looks like midnight. What guards will he see to midnight? Makes no sense. Let me look again. No, that isn't C. Here. No. Looks like... I know what it is. What? T. T. T to guards at midnight. I don't... What was it Ginger said to tell Curran? Don't drink the tea. It's poisoned. It was the custom at that time for a local tea shop to send a man with a tricycle around the airport every night with a huge container of hot tea. It was a familiar sight to everyone on the field, and the sound of his funny little French taxi horn was the signal for everyone to have his tuppence ready for his tin cup of the stuff. The GOC's plan was obvious. If that tea were poisoned, then if they all drank it, and if half a million pounds in gold lay unguarded with a dead man at the gate, a most diabolical scheme. Nevertheless, a feasible one, by the GOC's reckoning. But he had overlooked some factors in his reckoning. One factor he'd overlooked was a rough, tough man's aversion to poisoning a wartime friend. The other was the flying squad. I sent men the following morning to all parts of London on a search for certain men whom we knew to have worked for the GOC before. A number of them were in prison. But we discovered that eleven of them had been mysteriously disappeared. They, we reasoned, had been mobilized by the GOC for final briefing and held in readiness for the attack. The GOC himself had left for parts unknown. He reappeared only once, and Vivian Morris reported that he had made a most curious purchase. Six pairs of nylon stockings, the largest sizes available. We knew something of the GOC's plans. This was our final briefing. In the flying squad's garage. Repeat your instructions, Nobby Clark. I'm to drive the sealed lorry that picks up all the guards and takes them to the shelter. I drop off the flying squad man for everyone I pick up. The flying squad men are to be dressed in BOAC uniforms like those the guards wear. Each will be armed with a truncheon or a rubber cough. At the shelter, I'm to tell the guards I pick up what is going on. Right. Detective Sergeant Norton, what do you do, lion tamer? I'm in charge of the flight squad men that will be planted in the bonded warehouse where the money is. And you, Dusty Miller? I'd like to be with Lion Time. What's your job? Oh, I'm in general charge of the cars. So I was welterweight champion. We'll really save one of them for you, Dusty. Say to it, Martin. All oh, right, Dusty. Now remember, not a man must touch the team. Oh, no chance. Not that poison had hurt any of you, but <laughs> I, I shall need it for evidence. Couldn't we offer them a drink, sir? Donald? Look, it's my airport and it's my responsibility. What do you do? 
I just sit in that bloody little shelter by the telephone, and when they're all inside, I'm to lift the receiver. Good. And a sergeant from the 999 room? Constable Law, sir. I want to watch the special switchboard for it to light up when Mr. Rhodes lifts the receiver. And then? Then at once I'm to shout into my wireless microphone one word. Well? Go. Where's Dusty Miller? Oh, then I bellow you each and the cars with the rest of us converge on every entrance to the airport. Render such assistance as might be necessary. None will be necessary, Dusty. And Lawton, when do you start operations? Not till they start to open the safe, sir. Then what? Then we smite them and hypnotize them. Carry them all off to the pokey. To the what? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, that's Canadian. Uh, to the bowels of the vast time. And when you're done, boys, Heathrow will supply beer for all. A bottle of pigs! Beer and bandages, boys. The day came. The airplane from America arrived with the gold. It was transferred under heavy guard to the bonded warehouse. Donald Rhodes supervised that himself. I joined the guard at the gatehouse of the airport about 11 that evening. It was very quiet. That'll be Clark taking our men around and picking up the regular guards. Very lonely and very quiet. Maybe they're not come, I thought. I borrowed a cigarette from the gate guard, but I crushed it out. They mustn't know there's anybody here besides you, I told him. That's right, sir. Squidge down on the floor. I waited. That was Nobby, taking the regular guards to the shed. I... Who's that? I gave it, sir. Yes? Clark here. Tell Mr. Sheehan I've picked up all the guards and our people are waiting. Yes, it was... I heard him. <laughs> Just in time, sir. Here comes the tea. The man with the tricycle came up and stopped. <laughs> Hello, Herbert. Hello, James. So it's going to be late. How come? Eh? Got your gin cup? Yeah. Some guard or somebody stopped me down the road a bit and demanded what I was doing. Made me open up the tea and let him look at it. Got all cold, I'm afraid, him staring at it. All right, Tuppence, please. Right. Go on, then. The guard brought in the tea, which we set on the floor to keep as evidence. The driver came back with the empty container and went on about his business. The guard and I crouched on the floor of the little hut, waiting. Only the sound of a belated airplane or two broke the silence. It was half an hour later when we heard the sound of a lorry. I crawled under the table. The guard lay back in his chair, motionless. The lorry stopped at the gate and a man got out. He looked in our window. Here's one of them now. I stood up cautiously. The lorry moved straight to the bonded warehouse and stopped. We heard them at the door. We kept quiet in the dim light. The door opened. I watched through a crack in the sheltered door. My hand on the telephone to the 999 room. We sat in our cars, motors running, hidden at the road junctions all around the airport. My eyes began to hurt watching that switchboard. I said to the guards in the shed, now mind you, not a sound. I could see the shadowy figures clustering about the door to the bonded warehouse. A man whispered in my ear. What have they got on their heads? They look like ratty elephants. They had women's stockings on for masks. They sure looked weird with their legs hanging down over their faces. I hope the GOC is with them, I thought. The last one entered. I picked up the receiver. There it is. Go, you sons, go. Come on, the flying squad. They're at the safe. I saw a man running towards me. He tore the stocking from his head and I leaped out the door at him. Stop! Stop, I yell, stop! I'm Inspector Sh When I came to an hour later, I discovered the grandfather of all bumps on my head from the loaded cosh the man had caressed me with. My men of the flying squad stood about, many of them bandaged to the eyes, but all happy quaffing beer. We tried up the score. 
Eleven prisoners, including the one who had struck me and whom the gate guard had taken care of. Two broken arms, one mashed nose, and a turned ankle. A pile of heavy cushions and short iron bars the robbers had carried. And the 388,000 pounds still untouched. The prisoners bore a large variety of contusions, black eyes and broken heads. I, uh, I had a headache for a week. We never did catch the GRC, but we sent 11 of his men to prison, having caught them red-handed. And to this day, no one has ever dreamed of robbing Heathrow again. If they do, son, may I have a chance at him, too? heard another true story from the files of Scotland Yard. Only the names were, for obvious reasons, changed. Research for Whitehall 1212 is done by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic stories of some of its most baffling cases. These accurate dramatizations, which are presented exclusively by NBC, are drawn from the official files of Scotland Yard. They're true pictures of the operations of the world's most famous crime detection organization. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The research is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. And the stories for radio, which are performed by an all-British cast, are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the principal participants in case number 108-MR-131. Two of these persons have been hanged for murder. Private Eric Slade, 22, of the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. I was a bomb disposal man. Gladys Brown, who wanted to be a dancer. I'm not so awfully bad-looking, am I? Melanie Rodier, 20, a French war refugee. Je suis une pauvre, ne suis pas riche. Charles Brooks, 31, taxi cab driver. It was a brand new American Plymouth, a grey one, model 1941. Inspector Stuart Wilcox of Scotland Yard. Which of those four voices sounds guilty to you? This lower ground floor corridor in which we're standing leads to Scotland Yard's Black Museum. Come down there with me. I, I'd like you to see an actual souvenir of an actual murder. This is the Black Museum. Oh, good afternoon, Wilcox. Good afternoon, sir. This is Chief Superintendent John Davidson, curator of the Black Museum. Well, how do you do? I expect you've never seen a place like this before. Look about, if you like. Now, the items we have here have all served in some way in the commission of a crime. Here's the bullet from a murderer's gun. This is the linen duster in which the body of a murder victim was wrapped. This, well, now, this is what you came to see. The one thing remaining from our murder case, number 108-MR-131. Uh, that was what you wished to see, wasn't it, Wilcox? Yes, yes, please. A rather expensive silver cigarette case. Initial. Somewhat tarnished today. It was once quite good looking, wasn't it, Wilcox? Yes, it was. I'll tell you how it came here to the Black Museum. A man died for it. Yeah, two men died for it, Wilcox. Human motives are curious. The compulsion to become a dashing hero that led a simple-minded young shop clerk to join the most dangerous service in the army. The urge to acquire a compelling and seductive personality that led a one-time housemaid into displaying herself as a striptease artiste in a 
tawdry nightclub in wartime London. Neither of them knew the other's true name. The striptease dancer Gladys Brown called herself Regina Montmorency. The absent without leave army private Eric Slade introduced himself to the glamour girl as Lieutenant Studs Farrell, erstwhile gangster. He took her for a ride in the huge red-painted bomb disposal squad lorry late one night in 1944. You did like my accent, Lieutenant. Sensational, I thought. Colossal. <laughs> you sound just like Hollywood. What? Hollywood. I said you sound like Hollywood. Oh, I was in Hollywood for a little while. Oh, were you really? Over the mob, you know. I've been talking about the Hollywood contracts. You have? Oh, yes, of course. Hollywood's always after me. Oh. Such a bore. Well, I like Chicago much better. Were you in Chicago long, studs? Oh, you could bet your bottom dollar on that, sister. We must have been ever so exciting. I've got a few notches on my gun. Oh, my. I say I'm no panty waste, my girl. Panty waste? That's what we call uh, a mother's boy in America. Oh, are you in America and then, Stud? Oh, I lived there a great deal. Really? All over the Middle West. Mm. Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis, Cicero, uh, Philly. You know, it's really dark. My! I was a cowboy for a while, too, on a ranch in Ohio. I've been around. Did you have a lot of moles? What, eh? Moles, you know, gun moles. You? How oh, it must be wonderful to be a mole. Ah, it's dangerous. Ah, I love danger. And you get so rich. Well, I've done all right. I should like being a gun mole, really. Really? Hmm. No, I sometimes think I should be a very good one. Although I'm a very good dancer, aren't I? Oh, you are. Peachy. I should think you'd miss pulling jobs. Huh, I've just pulled one. What? Where'd you think I got this lorry? Did you steal it? I reckon I sure did, sister. Studs, darling. Let's pull a job together. I'll be your gun, Mol, and we'll... Statement by Melanie Rodier to Inspector Stuart Wilcox in a nursing home at Ealing two days later. My name is Melanie Rodier. I've been in England five years. I lived in Moulin au Bois, which was quite close to Amiens. My home was destroyed by the bush, but I escaped and came here. At 11 o'clock, two nights ago, I was walking down Staines Road on my way to London, very near Runnymede. You were alone, mademoiselle? Yes, I was alone. I was carrying my valise. A large army lorry painted quite gaily in red stub, and the man asked me where I was going alone so late at night. Where were you going? I said I was walking to London to catch a train at Paddington to Bristol, where lives my aunt Becquerel. The man told me to get in the lorry, and he would drop me off at Reading, where he was going. He was an officer, and I was not afraid. It would be a great convenience. Were you carrying money? I'm a very poor woman, monsieur. I had all the money I possessed with me. How much? Five shillings, sir. So I was not afraid of being robbed for that little money. But when I started to mount to the seat of the lorry, the girl... Girl? What girl? Was there a girl? She was seated beside the officer, sir. What did she do? She struck me on my head with an iron bar so that I did fall to the road. Ah? What then? I was stunned, and, and she and the officer did jump down and hit me, and they robbed me of my five shillings and beat me until I was insensible. Uh, did you see their faces? Only a little. Mm. I, I would not know them again. And then? I did hear the woman say, What shall we do with the body? And I tried to cry out, but she did hit me with her fist. So I do not remember more until I find I am drowning. They threw you into the stream there. The Thames runs quite close to the road. They thought I am dead. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Afraid they did. And they have taken all my money and all my clothes. What is to become of me now? We'll find them somewhere. I came to England to escape my enemies. Mm -hmm. 
It was a matter that should have properly been handled by the county constabulary, of course, a simple assault upon a friendless person, happily not involving murder. But there were other circumstances. First, the fact that the assault had been committed and connived at by a person in the uniform of an officer of His Majesty's forces, driving a motor vehicle which was ob obviously an official one. Whoever it was had attempted murder once. They might try it again. And I confess I was unable to forget what the poor little French refugee had said. I came to England to escape my enemies. Detective Sergeant Kevin Moore and I discussed it in my office. Well, if it was a repainted lorry, sir, it could be only one thing. Bomb disposal people, of course. He's a little out of his territory up there in Runnymede, sir. With a girl at 11 o'clock at night. Well, you didn't ask my opinion, sir. Well, why do you think I called you in? Well, in that case, sir, my opinion is that it was some young ex-schoolboy officer who'd had several dozen drops too much in some bottle club in London. And wandering about, he saw the lorry standing somewhere and, well, pinched it for a lark. Well, joyride, we used to say. Innocent amusements of the young. Oh, I think so, sir. I doubt that French girl thinks so. Mm -hmm. And neither do I. They thought they'd drown the girl for five shillings. Mm. And I furthermore think they'll try it again unless we catch them first. Well, we'll try, sir. I'll get in touch with the bomb disposal people and find out if any officer of theirs was out with one of their lorries that night. Or if one of their lorries had been stolen and one of their officers absent without leave. Yes, sir. That, that, that's a good idea. Of course it is. If I'm right, which I probably am, teletype the number of the lorry and the description of the officer to all the police in this area. Yes, sir. And warn everyone who knows about this French girl's case to say nothing about it at all. Especially to the newspapers. Why is that, sir? If they find out they bungled their first try, our friends may become discouraged and abandon their promised career as criminals. We'll never catch them. Oh. It was the next day before I saw Moore again. When he came in to report what he had accomplished, I had news for him, too. I let him speak first. Well, sir, I've been in touch with the bomb disposal people. And? Oh, I've had to talk to millions of people, sir. Finally, I found the right ones to give me the reliable information. Yes? There was a lorry stolen, sir. Aha. Number W14519, an American-made ten-wheel six-by-six. Good. There is no officer missing, sir. Oh. All of them in the London district are accounted for, including one who was blown up trying to unscrew a fuse from a buried blockbuster that's been sizzling for a week in Shepherd's Bush. But there's a private missing, sir. Oh? Name of, uh, uh, Eric Slade. Former shop clerk, 22 years old, wears glasses, described as a mild-mannered little man, very quiet, residence when called up, clerk and well, sandy hair. He got a girl. <laughs> His mates say he was terrified of girls, sir. Doesn't drink or smoke. Doesn't seem the type to commit murder or try to, at least, does he? No. How did a man like that ever get into bomb disposal? Well, believe it or not, sir, he volunteered. <laughs> of course, he's been on permanent cook's police ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt he's our man, but at least we can help look for the poor little beggar. That is, if they want him back. Now I've got a bit of news for you. Oh? What's that, sir? Same man that pulled the French girl out of the Thames at Runnymede telephoned me. Well, what's he want, sir? There's been another attempt at robbery and murder. Attempt? Another girl riding a bicycle, run down by a red-painted lorry. Mm. A lieutenant, she saw his badges quite plainly. And a red-haired girl jumped out after her. Mm. She ran away, but she did hear the girl call to the lieutenant, addressing him as Studs. Dubs? Studs! Oh. Now, I want you to see your bomb disposal men and ask them if they have a lieutenant named Studs. Oh, excuse me. Inspector Wilcox. Yes? Well, he's right here. One second. For you. Oh, thank you, sir. Sergeant Moore here. Oh, yes, Sergeant Major. Oh? Where? Oh. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, by the way, do you have any officers named uh, Studs or Stubbs? Or... Studs! Studs. Yes, I'll wait. Who's that? It was the Sergeant Major I talked to, sir. Yes? Oh, none, eh? None at all? Oh, well. Thank you, Sergeant Major. All right. Bye. What was that? I found a stolen lorry, sir, a few minutes ago. They did? And parked all night on a street in Hammersmith in the rain. 
which has quite efficiently washed away all fingerprints, studs and his lady friend and all. Well, they're right back where we started. Yeah, we're further back than that, sir. How do you mean? Well, they've tried murder twice now, sir. The third time may be the charm. The portion of case number 108MR131 I'm about to play for you now is reconstructed from the statements made by Eric Slade and Gladys Brown at that trial at Old Bailey three weeks later. I assume it's correct and accurate because it came from their own lips as they were on trial for their lives. They were standing in a darkened doorway, they said, on Hammersmith Broadway late at night. Have I got to walk home, then? Regina, darling, I've only got ten shillings left. Ten shillings? The big shot gangster, the terror of Chicago and all. He's only got ten shillings. Well, I'll get some more. I'll get it now, gangster. I'm going to ride home. Regina, I can't go back and ask anybody for money. I'm absent without leave. I'm a wanted man. Oh. But you have to leave that lorry over there on the street. We could have ridden in that. Somebody would recognize the lorry and know that. Oh, is the big bad gangster afraid, then? You stow that. Oh, you're I'll... not afraid of girls, are you? I said stow <laughs> it. What kind of bad man you are. Brave enough to rob a poor girl of her five shillings. Five shillings. But when a man comes along, oh, no, not you. Not bloody well you, my darling. Even made me smash the poor thing on the edge. You weren't man enough I'll to. I'll throw her in the water. After I killed Don't her. Don't yell so. Oh, there's no one to hear me. I'm sorry I ever took up with you. I thought you was a man. No, Regina. Won't even step up and stick up a lousy taxi man. Let me walk home in the rain because you've not got that no, gun. No, Regina, Don't please. come back on me now. Take your hands off me. And I thought I was going to be your mall. Take your hands off me. You don't love me. Regina, I do love you. Well, then do something about it. Get me some money. If I'm going to be your mall, you've got to support me. Regina. Do you love me, stud darling? Regina, you know I love you. Look. What? Here comes a taxi cab. Stop him. No, I, I don't want to do anything Stop like him. That. Shout at him. He'll have lots of money. No, I don't think... Haven't we done that? Do you love me? Regina. Do you or don't you? Of course I do. You know that. Taxi! Don't, Regina. Taxi! Don't. Here, taxi! I don't want you. Now you've got to. Come on in afterwards. Oh, taxi! Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir? Stats. Are you... <clears throat> I mean... The driver, we wish to go to the top of King Street. Come on, Stats. Oh, uh, wait a minute, lady. What's the matter? Uh, this isn't a taxi. What? I mean, it's a private hire car. Oh, that's all right. Well, I don't know, lady. Costs a great deal more to ride a private hire car than a plain taxi cab. Am I... Uh, uh, he has the money, haven't you, dear? How much? Ten shillings. To the top of King Street? Shouldn't cost me more than one and six, your robber. Dad, dear. This is a private hire car, sir. I can charge what I like, you know. I won't pay it. Darling, I want to ride home. You heard what the lady said, mister. It's a filthy night, sir. There are eight many taxi cabs about the fare of retention. Come on, darling. We can afford it. We'll have lots of money later, you know. Come on. Coming, sir. Of course he's coming. Get in, stunt. Top of King Street, sir? We'll tell you where to stop. Yeah. Wait until we're almost there. Now, uh, what say, miss? I was talking to my boyfriend. Oh, sorry. I say, you must make lots of money in this business. Oh, we do all right, miss. Hear that? Mm-hmm. Get your pistol out, darling. I've got it. But I don't want to use it. Very bad night, ain't it? It is for you. Pardon? I said yes. Hope you don't mind too much about that ten shillings fare, sir. A man's got to make a living, ain't he? <laughs> well, what's the funny, miss? Oh, um, we've got a better way of making money than you have. Haven't we, stud? Yes, we have. We're gangsters. What? Gangsters, we're gangsters. <laughs> I, I shouldn't laugh, buddy. He was a gangster in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, look here now. Keep your eye on the road, Mac. Hey, look here, mate. I'm not in the mood for your practical jokes. This isn't a joke. Well, stop poking at me. That's a revolver he's poking in your neck, buddy. What? A pistol. What do you want? All your money. I'll give you my money. Of course you will. Stop the car. All right. 
I'll give you my money. Keep. I'll give your hands out of your pockets. What are you going to do? Shut up. All right, Regina. Move to one side. What are you going to do? That you don't have to. You shut up. <laughs> Get to one side. Now look here, friend. I... I'll show you how I deal with rats. <laughs> Now say you're not. No, you can't sell us. He's seen us and he'll turn us in. I'll cut him. No, no, no. Two. (laughs) Message from J Division Metropolitan Police to Inspector Stuart Wilcox the following morning. Yes, sir. In a ditch alongside the top of King's Road. Shot twice through the head. Apparently dumped in the ditch late last night. Yes, sir. Robbery was apparently the murder. His pockets were all empty. Tire marks on the roadway, very faint in the rain, as if a car had been stopped there. Body's been taken to the mortuary in Horseferry Road. That's all we have, sir. The body of the unfortunate victim lay in the mortuary for three days without identification. Although it was obviously murder and we had no single clue to go upon, we were not idle. A detail from Scotland Yard had been hurried out to the place where the body was found immediately upon receipt of the message from J Division. With great difficulty, they had succeeded in making a plaster cast of the faint tire marks and the laboratory was able to establish with some accuracy the fact that the tires were identical with those on the model 1941 Plymouth. Beyond that, there was nothing. Until a Mrs. Charles Brooks of Hammersmith identified the body as that of her missing husband, a private hire car driver. I spoke to Kevin Moore about it. Something extremely suspicious keeps occurring in this thing, Kevin. Then I lay your threepence. I'm thinking about the same thing, sir. Hammersmith? Right, sir. We found the lorry parked in a Hammersmith street first. And the dead taxi driver lived in Hammersmith. And the place they found the body was at the junction of Kings Road and Hammersmith Broadway. You suppose our man Studs lives in Hammersmith? Or perhaps his girlfriend. You think it was them, sir? I don't know, Kevin. But when we get a series of coincidences like this... Well, it's the only symptom of a lead we have. Let's follow it through. Now, you suppose they've got that car? Oh, it'll be easy enough to find, sir. We've got the number and description of it from the man's wife. Mm Mm-hmm. Here it is. Ray Plymouth Saloon, 1941 model. License number GKP401. About 2,300 miles on the speedometer. I'd be an awful fool to drive it about town. I have an idea. He is a fool. Come in. Uh, I'm from the detail that was uh, searching the pawn shop, sir. Oh, oh, oh. Do come in. Did you find anything? Yes, sir. Yes. Cigarette case. Pawned at a shop in Soho, sir. It's Brooks, all right. See his initials inside here? C E B. Christmas, 1939. It's on the list Mrs. Brooks gave us, sir. Quiet. Did you find out who pawned it? Yes, sir. A young man in the uniform of the IOC. Officer? Uh, Private, sir. Name? Private S. Farrell, sir. That's a new one. Sir, I know something. What? That's our studs. How do you know? Well, look, I, I, I read a book once. Well. It was an American book, sir, and it was written by a man named Farrell. This man's not an American. No, sir, but maybe he read the same book and remembered. Um, let's try this all over again, old chap. Sir, the name of the book, which was all about Chicago in America, was Studs, uh, Stud, Stud something or other. Anyway, he was a very tough young man. Uh. Well, maybe our man's read the same book. Well, now. Sir, this is a typical Chicago style affair, isn't it? And you were talking of coincidences? Our man Stud is the murderer, all right. You see. Well, then, I'll tell you what you do, Kevin. What, sir? You go find Mr. Studs Farrell, the amateur Chicago gangster, for me, will you? Well, I'll try, sir, but he's not an amateur any longer. He's turned professional. Wireless communication between Scotland Yard's 999 room and a patrol car two nights later. J23 calling MG2W. J23 calling MG2W. J23 calling MG2W. Over. MG2W to J23. Over. MG2W. This is J23 near Fulham. The wanted Plymouth saloon car, license number GKP401, has been located. It's parked in a dead end road near here. Over. 
J23, this is MG2W. Keep car under surveillance. Follow it if it leaves, maintaining communication with me at all times. Send constable to nearest road intersection to guide other cars being dispatched now to scene. Notify us where constable guide is stationed at once. Over. J23 to MG2W. Understood. Over and out. A Scotland Yard patrol car with Sergeant Kevin Moore picked me up at my home in less than ten minutes. We proceeded at a good rate of speed to the Fulham district where a constable hopped on the running board and directed us quietly to the scene. We ran without light, stopping at the mouth of the cul-de-sac where the grey Plymouth was parked. We blocked the exit of the dead end with our car and waited. It was very quiet. Half an hour later, Kevin Moore spoke. Oh... Oh, I'm going to get out and stretch my legs. Well, go on. Careful, though. Don't make any noise. Uh, you don't go down and have a look at the car. Be quiet. All right, sir. Moore did not return for several minutes. I called softly to him. Kevin, are you all right? I'm all right, sir. We waited. I was dying for smoke. Better not smoke, though. Sir. Eh? Somebody coming. I hear him. Coming out of that house there on the right, I think. Yes, sir. Quiet. Hope they don't see Kevin. Getting in the car. Can't get past us, sir. I'm going down there. All right, sir. Turn your spotlight on them as soon as I call out. Yes, sir. Most certainly, yes. I'll have to ask you to keep your hands away from your pockets, sir. Look here. Or I shall most certainly be forced to break your jaw, sir. Turn on your light. Susan, stop. Hold it, hold it there. Miss Scotland Yard men. Good, sir. Now well, then, what's your name, Lieutenant? My, my, my name is... My name is Lieutenant Studs Fell. Oh, don't tell him, don't Well, sir, you. I'm Detective Sergeant Moore of Scotland Yard. I must detain you on the suspicion of being involved in the murder of Charles... You believe it was him? I didn't do it. Madam, we must detain you on the same charge. I warn you both that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. You haven't got anything on me. I take it, sir, that you have not read the third and last volume of the Studs Lonigan books, then? No. What's that one, Kevin? It's called Judgment Day, sir. At their trial at Old Bailey a few weeks later... Eric Slade and Gladys Brown fought bitterly over who had been the most guilty. The jury decided. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner Gladys Brown, alias Regina Montmorency, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. Do you find the prisoner Eric Slade, alias Studs Farrell, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. You find both prisoners guilty of murder. And that is the verdict of you all? That is the verdict of us all. Prisoners at the bar, you severally stand convicted of murder. Have you or either of you anything to say why the court should not give you judgment of death according to law? And the judge? Gladys Brown and Eric Slade, you have been found guilty after a long and patient trial by a jury of your fellow men, of a most brutal murder. I entirely agree with the verdict at which they have arrived. There is only one sentence which the law of this country allows me to pass upon you and upon each of you. The sentence of this court upon you and upon each of you is that you be taken to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution. That you be there, each of you, hanged by the name until you are dead. And that your bodies respectively be buried within the precincts of the prison in which you shall have been confined before your execution. And may the Lord have mercy upon yourselves. Amen.
You have heard the story of case number 108MR131 from the files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed for obvious reasons. Research has been prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its secret files to bring you the authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here are the participants in case number 604-MR-530 from the official files of Scotland Yard. Leo M. Stefanovich, former member of the Polish Navy. Yes, I deserted the Navy. Marian Konieczki, who had fought in Spain. What I am interested in is money. Kazimir Kashba, who was found dead. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc. It's a living... Superintendent Alistair Watkins of Scotland Yard. I must warn you that if you expect high adventure in Limehouse or sinister orientals lurking in dark byways, you'd best turn off your wireless now. We're quite ordinary people at Scotland Yard. Professional policemen, catchers of criminals, and we don't go in much for the picturesque, the way we are sometimes pictured. However, If you'd like to see how we proceed upon a case, I'll ask you to step inside our black museum and meet the man in charge of it. Come in. This is Chief Inspector John Davidson, who's in charge here. How do you do? I'm afraid that the so-called black museum is neither black nor a museum. Nor is it a grand guignol. We have here a large number of guns, knives, other weapons which have been used in crimes. They have also disguises, clothing, exhibits of all sorts that have helped in solving many of these crimes. I think you ought to explain, John, why we keep these gruesome relics. Yes, indeed. They're here for a purpose quite removed from idle curiosity. They're principally for the use of the men of Scotland Yard in studying crime techniques and exemplars of crime methods. They bring to life the cold words contained in our files, and the most useful is was graphic. For example, in this case, Superintendent Watkins is reenacting for you. Now, this is a bullet that killed a man. It was fired from this gun. That it took caliber warm automatic pistol. And it was Scotland Yard's job to prove that. And this, the top of an ordinary mechanical pencil. This is a very important bit of evidence. Just a cheap little metal pencil. It wasn't cheap for the man who lost it, John. It cost him his life, you see. We were standing in the corner of a saloon bar in Whitechapel, talking. Albert Stevens, the copper's narc, and me. I expect you don't know what a narc is. N-A-R-K. In America, I think you call him a stool pigeon. Every detective in the world has his pet knock, and Albert Stevens' mine. It was an insignificant place we were in, and Albert Stevens' two mild and bitters had set him talking sixteen to the dozen. I don't suppose you'd know him by sight, sir, but I could tell you how to find him. That is, I've seen him about here and there. It's American cigarettes are ending now, but they ain't got many left. And when they're sold out of them, they'll try something else. Have you got any ideas of it? No, sir, not yet. But it'll be something big, I'm sure of that. Do they know you, do you suppose? <laughs> Nobody knows it's a taxi driver, sir. They've rode in my cab twice now, and they've never even looked at my face. But 
<laughs> I've looked at them. Will you have another mild and better, Albert? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say no, sir. Here, miss. Fill this up here, will you, again? Will you? Thank you. They're some kind of foreigners that they are. Uh, thank you, miss. Uh, this I know. They're in the black market up to here. You said that. What kind of foreigners? Mm, I can't understand them much, except when they talk about, well, what they think is English. Greeks or Spaniards or Russians, I think. All three of them. Oh, they tip quite nice, too. But uh, you're sure they're in the black market? No doubt about it, sir. I hear enough about it. Don't know their names. Well, one is called Marion. Marion? And the other's name is Kashmir. Kashmir. <laughs> Maybe he's an Hindu. And the other is a gentleman in some kind of navy, sir. Not ours. Some foreign navy. He wears a uniform. Who seems to be the boss? Well, I'd say this year Kashmir is, sir. Cool. He, he's a hard man, he is, sir. Is that all you know about them, then? That's all I know right now, sir. Well, ain't that worth three pints of mild and bitter, sir? Just about, Albert. Well, I was sort of hoping you'd have a spare ten shilling note on you, sir. I have, Albert, but not for you, my lad. When you've something better than a comic trio of foreigners who gibber about American cigarettes, maybe, but not till then. Would you like to buy a magnificent new solid gold mechanical pencil, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A sacrifice for ten shillings. <laughs> Where'd you get it? A lady gave it to me, sir. Now, what say? Say seven and six to you, sir. Come now, Albert. You know that's worth all of ninepence. Ninepence, then, sir. I need the money. Come off it, Albert. Well, then, sir. What? What? What did you say if I told you these foreign blokes is murderers? Shouldn't believe a word of it. Oh, they might, sir. Well, when you can prove it, come round and see me, Albert. Well, don't I get another pint, sir? Uh, here, miss... Another of the same for my friend here. Night, Albert. At Scotland Yard next morning, I walked leisurely down the long corridor on the second floor that leads to my office. A voice hailed me as I opened the door of my office, and I looked back. It was Detective Sergeant Llewellyn, a Welshman who had been a constable at the Water Street Police Station when I was a sergeant. Here was a welcome face. David, I said, I've not seen you in six months. Longer than that, indeed, Superintendent. It's ten months, and I'm very glad to be seeing you. Where have you been? To the Army all this time, sir. I was seconded to MI5. Yes, yes, I heard it that. It was tiresome work, but now I'm back, thanks indeed to the Lord. <laughs> Taking a well-earned rest, I expect. Oh, indeed, goodness, no. There's no rest for the wicked. <laughs> I'm on a case already. And we have dinner this evening, then? I'm not so sure, sir. What have they given you? Oh, a murder. Good bloody one? I've just seen the man. He's bloody enough, indeed. They found him shot to death in his car early this morning. Where? Chepstow Place, Notting Hill. The constable who found him in his car, parked beside the curb, thought he was taken with drink and sound <laughs> asleep. But it was a thirty-two caliber bullet in the back of his neck and out the front of his head. Very gory. Know who he was? A foreigner, it seems, with the name of Kasmir Kasuba. Oh. Whatever's the matter, then? Do you know him? Come on in my room here. I don't know the chap, but I have an idea I know someone who does. Well, indeed, to goodness. Come on in. Come on in while I telephone. I've got his number in my book here. At least a number where I can reach him. Ah, here it is. Whoever is he, Superintendent? A chap named Albert Stevens, a narc. Talking to him just last night. Mentioned a chap named Kashmir, he called him. Foreigner. <laughs> just might be. Now, where's the beggar? Every little bit. Yes, who is it? Oh, oh, hello. Is Albert there? Albert Stevens? Yes, been home since yesterday morning. Who wants him? When he comes in, tell him to telephone Watkins. Watkins, got that? Hoskins? Watkins. W-A-T-K-I-N-S. He knows me. What do you want? Just tell him to call me, that's all. Does he know where to call? Yes, it's very important. Do you understand? He ain't come out since yesterday morning. All right, have him telephone me at once. You needn't shout at me, Mr. Bloodywell Watkins. Goodbye. 
Not there. They'll telephone me. I say, where can I reach you? Oh, I've got all this report on the man to write up, for goodness sake. I'll be in my office till noon. Oh, he'll telephone me before that, I'm sure. Well, I must be going, sir. Oh, I'm sorry I couldn't reach him just now. But I'll be in touch with you as soon as I hear from him. I'll be very grateful to you, sir. It was good seeing you again. Been a long time, Llewellyn. Well, goodbye. So long. So long, old chap. Oh, you dropped something. Eh? Hey, where? There on the floor, beside your right foot. Oh, must have closed this. What is it? I found it in the car with the dead man. Huh? The top of a cheap mechanical pencil. Let's see it. You mind? Not at all. Don't have to be careful of fingerprints. They've had it in the laboratory. Nothing on it. That is. Beg your pardon, sir. I've seen this pencil before, Lou. Oh, millions of them about, no doubt. The chap that was killed must have lost it. No. Eh? I've seen this particular one before. I saw it last night. I don't follow you, sir. <laughs> that settles it. Look here closely. Yes. See these initials scratched on it? Very tiny here. Probably done with a pocket knife. Is it? A.S. By crikey, A.S., that's what they are. Whose do you suppose? Uh, he offered to sell it to me last night. Who? Albert Stevens, the copper's knock. I was just trying to telephone. Goodness sake. So that's why he hasn't come home. Eh? He said he knew this Casimir. He said Casimir had money. And money was what he needed. Oh, Casimir was robbed, we know that. But I never knew a copper's knock to have the courage to commit murder, sir. <laughs> why, I... I bought him the courage, old boy. Four pints of mild and bitter. Suppose that makes me an accessory to murder? The constables who were dispatched to the home of Albert Stevens reported that he was still absent. At eleven next morning, he had not yet come home. His wife knew nothing of his whereabouts, nor did the garage people where he usually kept his cab. At noon, a teletype signal was sent to all metropolitan police stations giving a description of the man and the number of his cab, GLP-301. The same information was published next day in Metropolitan Informations, which goes to all police officers. There was no immediate response. Neither the man nor the cab could be found. By now, Superintendent Watkins had been officially assigned to the case, and on the morning of the fourth day, we held a strategy meeting in his office. He had some new information for me. They found the gun. Indeed, sir. They've been taking the car to pieces down at Hendon for us, you know. They found a thirty-two caliber Walther automatic pistol hidden in the lining of the top. Good. Our friend Casimir was killed by a thirty-two caliber bullet, you know. And ballistics assures me that this is the gun from which it was fired. Good. Fingerprints? Huh? Fingerprints? None. The ballistics say they're sure that more than one shot was fired from the gun. How could they tell that? There, there are two cartridges missing from the clip. And it seems they found too much powder fouling in the receiver and the barrel for one shot. I, I don't quite understand, but they're quite positive. They find more than one bullet? Only the one that went through Casimir's head was embedded in the dash of the car. Where's this other one, then? Somebody else's body, I expect. Hmm. But whose, I say? Yes. Oh, blast. Superintendent Watkins, him. Hi, Watkins. Fletcher here, T Division. Hello, sailor. Okay, we found your man, Albert Stevens. Oh, good. Found him. Oh. Where was he? Sitting in his taxi cab. Where? At the bottom of the Thames. What? Near Wapping Old Stairs. One of our boats found him. Is he dead? Twice dead, old chap. Drowned and a bullet through his heart. Well... So that's where the other bullet went. I admit I'd more or less dropped a brick in pinning all my hopes of a quick solution of the case on Albert Stevens. Llewellyn and I moved at once to realign our strategy. This was our estimate of the situation. It is possible that Stevens did murder Casimir, of course. Ah. Uh. Possible, but not probable. The forensic laboratory people, the ballistics people, say that the bullet they found in Stevens' body was fired from the same gun that killed Casimir. The thirty-two Walther automatic they found in the car. But then, who killed who? Uh, I suspect that 
Since the gun was found in the car with Casimir, he was the last one shot, wouldn't you? Well, then, of course, Stevens couldn't have killed him. Right. Stevens must have been dead and at the bottom of the Thames when Casimir was shot. Then who killed Casimir? Obviously not Stevens. The forensic laboratory can tell us who died first, I hope. We know. How? The gun. It was with Casimir, remember? Unless someone shot him, then took the gun and killed Stevens with it, pushed him into the Thames, and then brought the gun back. Sounds silly. Indeed. Then who shot Casimir? One of Stevens' friends might have, if he knew Casimir killed Stevens. Revenge. How do we know Casimir shot Stevens? Well, we... Besides, Stevens didn't have any friends. Except me. And I don't think I did, huh? His wife, perhaps? Yeah. Perhaps. Well, besides, how could she get that gun? Hmm. No friends. None I know of. I knew Albert rather well. Ha. Huh. What? Casimir had friends, though. Albert told me about them. Who? A man named, um, this woman's name, um, uh, Marion. I don't know her. Him. And a man who wears a foreign navy uniform. Polish? Casimir was Polish. And a deserter. I suspect our man's a deserter, too. They were all mixed up in the black market, Albert said. What sort of black market, sir? Oh, all sorts, it appears. Why should they kill Casimir? And, or Albert Stevens? Well, Albert, that's simple. They found out he was an informer, a narc. Why Casimir? Oh, people have been murdered for money before. Perhaps Casimir was cheating them. He was apparently the boss. Well, a crook who cheats a fellow crook is asking for it. Let's get on to Marion and the Navy officer. All we have to do is find them. <laughs> Now, allow me to digress for a moment. There was, of course, no record anywhere of Casimir's former address. We put people on that at once, suspecting that Marion and the Navy officer might live close to Casimir's home. But another day dragged by without tangible result. I was sitting gloomily in my office, trying to think of a more tenable theory than the one we had tentatively adopted. Oh, bless the phone. Yes, Watkins here. Glad to see you, sir. Inspector. What's her name? Name, please. Miss Dottie Tulsa. Spell it, please. T-A-L-I-A-S-E-R-R-O. You've heard of me. I'm the actress. Yes, Dottie Tulsa, sir. And... Actress. You know me. Actress, sir. What she want? She said it's in connection with Casimir... What was her name, miss? Cashew, but I said. I heard her. Yes, sir. Send her in. Yes, sir. And ask Sergeant Llewellyn if you'll just step in here. Yes, sir. Come in. Good afternoon, madam. Are you Superintendent Watkins? I am. Sit down, madam. I thank you. <laughs> You said you knew something about Casimir Kashuba. Yeah, I saw on the express that he's dead. Extremely. And good enough for him, I'd say. You knew him? Yes. He was a crook. I'm afraid you're rather late in telling us that, madam. Well, I mean to say I... Uh, what uh, sort of dealings did you have with him? Well, I never had any. Well, I mean, he cheated me, and now he's dead. How am I going to get back the 17 pounds I gave? That's what I want to know. Why did you give him 17 pounds? Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, come on in, Llewellyn. This is Miss Dotty. Yes, sir. I'm a music hall star at the Ship's Bush Empire. How do you do, madam? Sit down, Llewellyn. Seems Miss Telfer has given Casimir 17 pounds. Whatever for, miss? Well, that was rather silly of me, but I couldn't resist it. Resist what? Well, I was having a, a late supper after the show last Tuesday, and there was a man, Kashmir Kashuba, it turned out to be, sitting two tables away from me. Is that the first time you met him? Of course. Do you think <clears throat> that... Uh, on the table before him was the most magnificent handbag. Handbag? Um, a woman's handbag, the kind I hadn't seen for simply years. I couldn't resist doing what I did. What did you do, madam? 
Oh, I know it's breaking the law, but <laughs> isn't everyone in the black market? Not everyone exactly. Oh? Oh, well. I just stepped over to the table and introduced myself, and he gave me his name, and I said, Would you mind terribly telling me where you got that adorable bag? I wanted one myself, you know. Black market. So um, he said he manufactured them and that I could have one if I liked. All I had to do was to give him 17 pounds so that he could buy the special leather it was made of. And in a day or two, I could call at his flat and it should be ready for me, do you see? And you fell for that old one. You called at his flat. Would you believe it? When I called. He professed never having seen me. He said he was not a manufacturer. He was. And nothing I could say would make him give me back my 17 pounds or the bag. And did you kill him then? I did not. Later, perhaps. I never killed anyone in my life. I'm a law-abiding... Oh, will you give us the address, my dear law-abiding young woman? Oh, it's in Maida Vale somewhere. I think I have it here. In my shabby old handbag. Thank you very much, Miss... Telfer, an, an actress. actress, I think you said, yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, that'll be all, Miss Telfer, and thank you very much. Come along, Llewellyn. Right. Yes, but how am I going to get my 17 pounds back? The man's dead You're now. not going to get it back, Miss Telfer. What? You're very fortunate. The black markets cost you only 17 pounds. It cost Casimir his life. Very little one. Within 20 minutes, a Scotland Yard car dropped us at the address in Maida Vale Miss Telfer, actress, had supplied us. We interviewed the proprietor of that dismal place, a cross-eyed young man in an unusually dirty waistcoat in the red Mingus tartan. His name, he informed us, was in Kalbfleisch, and he had a cold. Well, he ain't here. We're quite aware of that, my good man. He's dead. Did you murder him? Bell. Are you in the black market, too? Bell. May we see his room? Tay Dis, Eddie Bo. Whose is it, then? About the man. Who? An officer. <laughs> Navy officer. Oh? RN? RNR? Or RNVR? Not one of ours. <clears throat> Polish Navy. When did this Polish naval officer take the room, Mr. Kalbflash? Uh, day after the murder. Oh, you know the day of the murder, then? I can read. <coughs> Was it all the papers? Is this man here now? No. Will he return? He always has. Was this naval officer a friend of Casimir's? I don't know. May we see the room? Got a warrant? Yes. All right. <coughs> Second door on the left. Come on, Lou. All right. It's unlocked. Come on. No, leave the door open, Lou. Our friend with a runny nose might just warn him that we're here. Right. I'll keep watch. While Llewellyn kept watch from the open door, I made a quick search of the place. I found nothing at all of any apparent importance until I went through the pockets of the navy greatcoat in the closet. I was about to exhibit my findings to Llewellyn when he hissed sharply at me from the doorway. What's up? Chap coming in, wearing a navy uniform. People in your room, Commander. Who are they? Police. Scotland Yard. What, what, what do they want? If you'll come in, Commander, we'll be glad to tell you. Who are you? Sergeant Llewellyn of Scotland Yard. I think you'd best come in, sir. Come in, sir. What, what is the meaning of this, may I ask? What is your name, please? Leo M. Stefanowitz, Commander of Polish Navy. What do you want? I should like to ask you a question. Well... May I ask you where you got this mechanical pencil, sir? Uh, I will tell you. I got it, uh... Well, uh, where did you get it? I didn't kill him. Kill whom, Commander? Why, Kasimir Kashuba. Uh, this was Albert Stevens' pencil, Commander. I didn't kill Albert. The top of this pencil was found in the car with Kasimir Kashuba's body, Commander. I didn't do it. Perhaps you can explain, then. Yes, I... Well... 
Uh, Marion did the killing. Oh, indeed, Marion. Uh, yes, I, I told him not. It was Marion who did it, but not me. Oh, our friend Marion, he did it. Hmm. Yes, I am telling you the truth. Marion. You know where Marion is? I, I will take you to him. Yes, I, I will help you. He did it and I will help you find him. Uh, please, and let me please, take you to him. Please. Will you please? Casimir was my friend. I'm just wondering something, Inspector. Eh? Uh, huh? I'm wondering if Albert Stevens was also his friend. Let's go and find your friend, Marion, shall we, Commander? It was a quiet little hotel we drove to in the West End. Inspector Watkins and me and the commander all jammed in the police car together. The clerk nodded in a familiar way to Stefanovitz when we entered. Is my friend in? Yes, sir. Oh, don't announce us, please. We will work to lift ourselves. Uh, get in, gentlemen. All right. Uh, now, we shall see justice done. Indeed. The first floor, gentlemen. Uh, the door directly opposite. Uh, here. Who is it? Uh, Leo, Marion. Who is with you? No one. Come in. Ah, Leo, my boy, I am glad... We are from Scotland Yard, sir. I warn you, both of you, that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. What is the meaning of you, you murderer? What? Yes, these gentlemen have come to arrest you for the murder of Casimir. Sacred! You, you traitor! You, 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 you coward! Arrest him, gentlemen. He is the murderer. You, 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 look, look, these men. He's the one who fire shot. Huh? He's the one who did it. I, I see him do it. You see me? You know you did it. He's I, the one I'm gentleman. not. I'm not. He should catch me from behind as I sit in front seat. I was in the front seat. He did it. Sacre! Oh, talk, talk, Rich. You sound very good. You murderer. You did it. You 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 gentlemen, you gentlemen. Marian Konechny and Leo Stefanovich, I arrest you both on suspicion of having been involved in the murder of Casimir Kasuba. And of Albert Stephen. You've both been warned. Have you nothing to say? At the trial, the two men admitted all the details of the two murders. Albert Stevens, it seems, had talked too much about his relations with the police, and someone in a moment of rage had shot him and his cab had been dumped into the Thames. Walking away from there together, they'd stolen a motor car. Casimir Kashubo, who had been drinking heavily, twitted his companions about the new hold he had on them as murderers. He boasted that he had had no part in the crime, and one of the two men had shot him in the back of the neck with a Walther automatic pistol. Each man blamed the other. The jury took 25 minutes to decide who was guilty. Mr. Justice McConaughey placed the black cap on his head. Marian Konyatsne, Leo Stavarovich. The jury have found you and each of you guilty of the murder of Casimir Kashuba. It is the sentence of the court that you and each of you be taken to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution. That you be there, each of you, hanged by the neck until you are dead. And that your mind is respectfully... The two men appealed the verdict and won. They were immediately tried for the murder of Albert Stevens and again heard the fatal words... That you there, each of you, be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The latter sentence was carried out. You have heard the eighth in the series Whitehall 1212, compiled by special permission from the official files of Scotland Yard. Only the names have been changed. Otherwise, the story is true. Research for Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express, and the stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper and produced by Jack Goldstein and Collie Small. <laughs>
Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's adventure zooming your way today with Joel McRae featured in another authentic story based on the files of the Texas Ranger. Whitehall, one, two, one, two, quickly, please. This is Scotland Yard. <laughs> First time in history, Scotland Yard opens a secret file to bring you authentic, true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories, the unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reacted for you by an old British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is prepared by Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here were the participants in Scotland Yard case number 505-MR-074. Donald Sims, the cabinet maker. I have some theories. Albert George Corcoran, the man who owned a gun. I tried to get it back from him. Patricia Emmons, who married a stranger. To my sorrow. Chief Inspector Grant McCrimmon of Scotland Yard. I think that Chief Superintendent John Davison has it here in the Black Museum. The one bit of evidence upon which the whole case turned. Shall we go inside and ask him to show it to us? Come on in. Oh, it's not half as gruesome in here as people would have you believe, so don't be squeamish. Good afternoon, Meg. This is Chief Superintendent John Davison, ladies and gentlemen. How do you do? I expect you're glad to see that this is not a chamber of horrors, as it is sometimes represented, and that I'm not a masked monster. This black museum, as we call it, is merely a repository for items that have figured in crimes of various sorts. It's regrettable that so many of those crimes were murder. These things are here for a purpose. It's a curious act that criminals are seldom original in their approach. Here are informative, tangible objects that are often of enormous help to us. Hence, for your information, the black museum. Now, I think Chief Inspector McCrimmon here wants you to see what we have on our case 505-MR-074. And here it is. A brass cartridge case from a Browning automatic pistol. You'll note it still has traces of a sticky tape on it. And some photomicrographs of this case and of another similar one. That's all there is, Meg. Well, they were quite adequate, John. Yeah, they earned the hangman another ten pounds. I was quite astonished when I received the call. Chief Inspector McGrimmon here. His Majesty will speak to you, sir. His Majesty? Say, who is this? My name is George, sir. Well, uh, I say, sir, I mean... Uh... I am not the King of England, Chief Inspector, although my name is George also. Oh. I have been exiled from my own country for some years. I have been in residence in London, however, for some time. Yes, sir, uh, Your Majesty. I have just taken a house in Belgravia. Oh, now I know who you are, sir. You're King George of... Precisely. Look here, Chief Inspector. I went around to my new place this morning. Yes, sir. And, and I was unable to get in. Oh, some of your enemies, sir, uh, from your own country... Oh, I'll have Spike Branch get onto it no, at once. No, 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 it's not that at all. I am locked out. I I don't quite understand, sir, uh, Your I Majesty. I can't get in. Oh, you mean there's no one in the house, sir? My housekeeper, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Jessica Holmby, has been staying there alone, but she doesn't seem to be there. Uh, I'm a little alarmed. Your Majesty, do you suspect she I has... I have no cause to suspect her of anything beyond the fact that she seems to be missing. Uh, but uh, I'm a little uh, uneasy about uh, trying to enter. Bond. I have many enemies, Chief Inspector. And Scotland Yard men are expendable, are they not, sir? Well, I'll investigate at once, Your Majesty. The address is... Thank you. Hey, we know the place, sir. Preliminary report of Chief Inspector McCrimmon's investigation dictated by himself to Miss Sheila O'Malley, Scotland Yard stenographer. A careful search of four of the ground room floors failed to disclose the presence of anything resembling a bomb of any sort. But upon entering the quarters assigned to the housekeeper, Miss Jessica Holmby, an important discovery was made. The body of Miss Holmby, aged 41, was found seated in an armchair opposite the door. She had been shot in the head. The body was identified by the King's equerry, Monsieur Langlois, who accompanied us. 
Item, a brass cartridge case, apparently from a Browning automatic pistol, caliber thirty-eight, was found on the floor near the door, thus establishing the probable position of the killer when the shot was fired. Signed, Grant McKimmon, Chief Inspector, CID. There was but one other possible clue. The torn corner of a card which was found in the corner of the room. There was nothing in the room nor the housekeeper's belongings that it might have been torn from. We kept it. Sergeant Peter Monk, who had been assigned to the case with me, presented the most immediately useful clue. I just thought it might be worthwhile, Chief Inspector, to have a look in the mailbox. I was lucky. Well, let's see it, Peter. Hmm. Postmark Brighton. Well, she'll never open it. Hmm. My darling Jessica, won't you please write me or telephone me here? I've been trying to reach you by telephone for two days, but there is no answer. I am frantic. All my love, Poopsie. Poopsie? Oh, what a frightful name. You suppose it's a man? A pet name, no doubt. It's revolting. When was it mailed? The day before you found her. Well, see if you can find Poopsie or Brighton, Peter. Perhaps he or it can talk as well as he can write. It's quite a job, sir. No, I don't want you going up and down Brighton front crying, Poopsie, Poopsie. People will follow you with a butterfly <laughs> net. I was thinking of that, sir. Telephone Jessica's sister in Kensington. She's probably heard of him. Uh, yes, sir. Poopsie. Your sister knew Poopsie fairly well, she said. The man with the revolting pet name was Donald Sims, a cabinet maker... 39 years old, and he worked in a penny peep show in Brighton. She gave us his address, and Peter Monk and I took a trip to that seaside resort. Well, we found the house, and we met Mr. Sims. Fit. I will not say that name again. It didn't fit this tall, curly-haired fellow at all. He crushed my hand. How do you do, sir? And this is Sergeant Peter Monk. Oh. Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> I suppose you want to talk to me about the late Miss Holmby. You knew her quite well, did you not? We were to be married in a month. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Yes. We kept it a secret. We kept it secret. Not even her sister knew our plans. I suppose it was she who told you about me. Uh, yes. I'm afraid she didn't like me very much. Oh, why? Oh, sure, I don't know. Sisters are often like that. Aye. I was very much opposed to the idea of her becoming housekeeper to the king. Oh? So many odd people about, you know. People with grievances and all that. I thought it was dangerous being there all alone and what not. Dealing with foreigners. I uh, see. <clears throat> I'm very much of the opinion that one of these foreign people is responsible. Aye, we considered that. They're making a thorough check of everyone who visited the place. I hope you are. Uh, how long had you known Miss Holmby, Mr. Sims? About eight months, I think. It was rather a case of love at first sight. Mm -hmm. We were very much in love. Uh, were you in the habit of visiting her often? Oh, quite frequently, yes. But I've been very busy recently, and I tried telephoning her instead. As you know, I was quite unable to reach her for several days, and then things happened. If I'd only gone up to London, I might have been able to prevent it, at least. I keep thinking so. Well, I misdoubt you could have done anything. I would have given my life for her. Well, uh, I loved her, gentlemen. <coughs> Your uh, uh, wedding plans were almost completed, then? Yes. I'm most terribly depressed about all this, gentlemen. I, uh, I can sympathize with you, sir. Yes. Could I offer you a small libation, gentlemen? I have a fresh bottle of Glen Livid in the cupboard. Well, thank you, no, sir. I never touch it, sir, thanks. You don't mind if I do, then? No, not at all. I've done nothing but sit here in my room and drink all alone since I heard of this. I'm a little surprised that you have not yet been up to London, Mr. Sims. Sir? Yeah. I couldn't bring myself to go to that place where she died. Are you sure you won't have a small libation? Thanks. Uh, we must be getting back to London. Oh, surely you don't have to go at once. I'm afraid we must. Thank you for your time, Mr. Sims, and let me assure you again of our sympathy. Oh, I wish you'd stay a little longer. I 
have some theories I should very much like to pass on to you. Well, we should be talking to you again, sir, I fancy. You know, if what? We, if we discover anything more... All right, or... then we may need your help. Oh. Well, Slanter more, gentlemen. Slanter. Hey, come along, Monk. Right, sir. I'm sorry you gentlemen won't join me in a small libation. No, thank you. We shall undoubtedly be seeing you. Find the assassin of my love. Hey, we shall try. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Sims. Oh, goodbye, gentlemen. And thank you. Pupsy. Dreadful, isn't he? Well, he'd, he'd impress a woman. Oh, well, let's go over to the seashore and see how he impresses some of his fellow workmen. You're suspicious of him, aren't you? I'm trying very hard not to be suspicious of him, monks, old boy. We tramped along bright in front with the din of the dance band in our ears for a good while before we came across anyone who knew Sims well enough to discuss him with us. At last, a Brighton rock huckster at whose place of business we stopped admitted knowing him well. Yes, I know Johnny Sims. I knows him well enough that I don't want never no dealings with him. Not no dealings what so bloody ever. <laughs> What's he done to you? <laughs> Plenty. Bright Rock! Who has Bright Rock? Take a bit of Bright Rock home for the kids, Missy. Only a bobble stick. Ah, uh, Chip. Plenty enough, mate. What? Well, I can't prove what he done to me, but I can have me sus suspicions, can't I? He won't pay me, and I don't hold with fellas what commits bigamy anyhow. Bigamy? Huh? Well, it ain't no secret, I'm telling you, mister. He got out of the stony lonesome not a year ago for marrying a bit of flapping Nottingham when he was already the husband and father of three kids and living with them right here in Brighton. Yeah. Take home a bit of Brighton Rock for the family. Here are. Only a bobber stick. Only a bobber stick. He was in prison? That bigamy, as I said. Ain't no secret around here. Are you sure? Well, ask anyone around here about Poopsy. <laughs> He's a bad lot, mate, if you ask me. Oh, that's really interesting. Yes, indeed. Uh, him and me used to be friends thick as thieves. We was, but not anymore, take my word for it. Not since he stole my gun. Stole your what? My gun, mate. My browning hoard of metal. Oh, it was quite legal. I still got the license. <laughs> that's all I have got. He took a fancy to it, he did, the stinker. Borrowed it from me. <laughs> Last I ever seen of it, the dog's body. Claimed he lost it. Didn't pay you for it? Not Poopsy, not him. Claimed he ain't got no money. What caliber was this gun? Eight? Oh, 38. Interesting. Huh? I bought the gun because I rather fancy target shooting, see? Had a chance to fire it only twice. Down at my place over there on the downs. He was with me. He liked it, so he borrowed it from me. Last I see of the thing, I bet he's still got it somewhere, hoping to spell it. My gun! Well, uh, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, uh, Corcoran, sir. Albert George Corcoran, late of the loyal regiment, now reduced to slim, bright, and bloody rotten, starving to bleeding death. Oh, well, I'll take a stick, Corcoran. Oh, here you are, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'll have one, too. Thank you, sir. Here you are. I say, sir, um, why was you so anxious to know about Poopsy Sims? Does everyone call him by that revolting name? He calls himself that, sir, the og. Fair turn your stomach, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. Was you think of an employing him, sir? They say he is a good cabinet maker, but Christ, what a stinker. Well, I don't think we shall employ him now, Cochran. Oh, you'll come to a bad end, sir. You know, I'm inclined to agree with you, Cochran. We walked to the nearest telephone box, and I called London, Whitehall, 1212. This is Scotland Yard. The Criminal Records Office, please. Criminal Records, sir? Yes, sir. Sergeant Hammond, the uh, Criminal Records Office. Hello? Hammond? Chief Inspector McCrimmon here. Oh, yes, sir. How are you? Hey, what do you have on a fellow named Donald Sims of Brighton, sometimes known as Poopsy? I remember his name. Something about him quite recently. Uh, just hang on, sir. Uh, look, I think he's wanted, sir. Why, how very delightful, Sergeant. Uh, hey, I'll wait. Uh, what's up, sir? Mm -hmm. Oh, Poopsie's a bad boy, it seems. Uh -huh. Worse than we think? Well, I'll tell you in half a moment. How are you there, sir? Aye. He's wanted for check fraud, sir. Travelling in rather high society, too. Well, how is that? One of the checks he forged is on account of royalty, that King George. Oh, that king that's just taken a new house in Belgravia? Yes. Got the chief. He's got the chief equerry for 
400 pounds. Say no more. Monks and I will fetch him in, full of dew of Glenlivet in three hours' time. <laughs> Accompanied by a slightly sozzled poopsie, Monks and I returned to London and deposited him for safekeeping on a charge of fraud. He promptly went to sleep on the floor of his cell in Bow Street. And Monks and I departed for a well-earned dinner of bubble and squeak, of which I'm inordinately fond. Oh, I also had two bottles of Guinness, I remember. Oh, the next morning, our prisoner safely incarcerated on his fraud charge, Monk. Monks and I departed again for Brighton. Monks, armed with such warrant, went on to Sims' rooms, whilst I paid a visit to Cochrane, the Brighton rock man. Well, good morning, sir. I'm most happy to see you again, sir. I'm in need of further information this morning, Cochrane. What kind of information, sir? (laughs) About Poopsie? Oh, don't say that name so early in the morning, Cochrane. It it makes me ill. (laughs) We took him back to London yesterday. (laughs) You did, sir. Aye, on a charge of defrauding by check. (laughs) Good. Who are you, sir? Well, I'm Chief Inspector McCrimmon of Scotland Yard. Who oh, I thought you was, Tex. I swear I did. Well, we are. Now, look here, Cochrane. You know, we may be able to get your gun back. No. But it won't be especially easy, you know. I know. It'll be very hard to identify, you see. Uh, the number was, uh, um... Oh, I don't remember the number. Oh, that's too bad. I wonder... Would you possibly have an empty cartridge case that was fired in the gun? Our ballistics laboratory could probably identify it that way. How? Of course, the, the firing mechanism always leaves marks on a cartridge case that are quite different from those fired by any other gun. Sort of uh, mechanical fingerprints. Huh? Exactly. You see, no two guns in the world leave the same marks on the base of a shell. Let me see. Now, I did have one, I know. I I, I only fired two rounds with it before Poopsie borrowed it. I, I had one when I wanted I do with it. You got it at home, perhaps? No, no, no. I had it here. Now, what did I do with it? Oh, come on, man. Think hard. I am thinking, sir. It's in your pocket, perhaps. No, I carried it for a long time, then I had some use for it. Let me see now. Uh... Oh, I know where it is. Good. Oh. Ow! Oh. Uh, let's see. It. Here it is. See, I used it for a spool to wrap this here sticky tape around. It was just the right size. <laughs> I see the mark she was talking about. Here, where the firing pin struck the primer. Are you sure that's from your gun, then? I swear to it. Hope to die, sir. Uh, you may have to swear to it. Or ain't no doubt about it. I'll match the gun all right. Every little mark it will. Here, sir. Let me take the tape off first. Oh, never mind. It's all right this way. Now, I wonder. One more thing. Yes, sir. Could you possibly find one of the bullets you fired with the gun? Well, I don't know, sir. I could find the spot where I fired them. It was in a chalk pit. Uh-huh. But whether them bullets are still there and whether I could dig them out... Well, I... we only need one. Sir... Eh? Hey? I know why you want that bullet. Uh-huh. You do? I know every gun leaves marks on a bullet so you can prove it comes from that gun and not no other. Aye, right, that's right. And what you want to do is compare one of my bullets with a bullet you think's been fired from it, too. Well, uh... Uh, Sir, uh, did, uh, did Poopsie murder somebody with my gun? I don't know, Cochran. Oh, no, sir. But you can help us find out. Sergeant Monk's painstaking search of Sims' room failed to discover the missing burning pistol. But in a pocket of a jacket in his cupboard, Monks discovered a torn, crumpled card. It was the announcement of a marriage between Donald Sims and a Miss Patricia Emmons of Nottingham. So we telephoned the Nottingham police, asking them if it would be possible for Miss Emmons to come to London to see us. She was waiting for us at Scotland Yard when we returned. Yes, I married him. To my sorrow. And you did not know that he was married at the time? No, I did not. His wife died during his bigamy trial. Did you know that, Monk? Yes, sir. I discovered it today. I discovered a great many things about him. Oh? He's a bad man. Let it rest at that. Uh, This uh, is uh, one of your wedding announcements, is it not? Oh, I thought they were all destroyed. Oh, I do wish you'd destroy that one. I'm sorry, Miss Emmons. He was money crazy. He said he loved me, but I discovered he thought I had an income. When he found I had nothing, he deserted me. It was while I was trying to find him that I found he'd married me bigamously. Aye, we we know about that. Now, uh, did you ever see a pistol in his possession, Miss Emmons? Pistol? Yes, of course. Could you describe it? A thirty-eight caliber Browning automatic pistol. 
I know about pistols. My Uncle James is a retired warrant officer in the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. Uh-huh. He was at the Woolwich Arsenal for years. And you'd testify in court that you saw that pistol in Sim's possession? Oh, I would indeed. May I ask why, please? I don't think you'd like to know why, Miss Emmons. You escaped with your life. <laughs> The cartridge case that Cochrane had given me, you know, the one that you saw in the Black Museum with the remains of sticky tape still on it, had been sent to the ballistics laboratory when we returned to Brighton. Kenneth Ogilvy, the technician, telephoned me, asking me to come up, which I did, and he sat me down before a binocular microscope. I hope your eyes are normal, Chief Inspector. I've adjusted the eyepiece to mine. Well, I'm three twenty. Good. Now, this is a comparison microscope, you know. Here on this side... Uh, No, don't look in the eyepiece yet. This one is the cartridge found at the king's house with the victim. Aye. And over here is the one you got with the tape on it. Aye. Now look. Uh You see? Uh, Just let me turn on it a wee bit. How the mark of the firing pin is exactly the same on both shelves. Aye. And the tiny scratches at the upper right. Aye, and these down here at the bottom too. Uh, The ones that look like an H. Uh, That's right. Well... I'd say they're from the same gun, all right. But will it convince a jury? Ah, don't worry about that, sir. When we get our photomicrographs prepared and labeled... Oh, if we only had the gun. I think it's only fair to warn you in advance, sir. A, a jury can believe just so much. But if they can't see the gun, only the cartridge case and the bullets that match the missing gun. Oh, if we're in worse shape than I thought. What can I do? Sir, as uh, one good Scots Presbyterian to another, have you tried prayer? I'll not tell you whether or not I prayed. You can judge for yourself by the results. But on the theory that the greater crime is the more important, Donald Sims was sent to my office at New Scotland Yard instead of the police court where he was to be examined in the forgery case. He sat before me at my desk. Monk was in a chair beside me, and uh, Miss Virginia Emmons sat in a corner of the room. Now, uh, Sims was quite self-confident. You can't cross-examine me. You know better than that, McCrimmon. I'll uh, overlook your rudeness, Mr. Sims. I have no intention of cross-examining you. I have no questions to ask of you. Oh, what about your pal there? You. I don't want to know anything, Sim. Oh, what's she here for, then? Who, Miss Emmons? You've got nothing on me any longer, Virginia. I paid for it. She'll ask you no questions. McCrimmon here. Who? Cochran. Oh, he has. Good. Good. Well, send it up to Ogilvy in the ballistics laboratory, please. Aye. All right. Thank you. <laughs> He's found the bullet, Monk. Uh-huh. Who? Oh, Cochrane. What? Now. What? Look here, Mr. Sims. This is a scrap of paper found alongside the body of Miss Jessica Holmby. This scrap exactly matches the torn wedding announcement Sergeant Monk found in your jacket pocket in your rooms. These comparison photographs show two cartridge cases. One was found at the scene of the crime. One was fired in a pistol which formerly belonged to the man Cochrane. A pistol which is known to have been in your possession. I will testify to that. Well, uh, you've observed that I have asked you no questions, Sims. Is that correct? Yes. Sergeant Monk and Miss Emmons are witnesses to that. That's right. right. What are you trying to do? I am relating certain facts to you, Mr. Sims. Ah, here's another. The forgery case in which you are at present involved concerns the King's equity. Now, I do not refer to His Present Majesty of England, but uh, you know who I mean. Yes. Now, finally... Our ballistics laboratory has in its possession a bullet fired from that pistol by the man Cochrane. 
to have also the bullet with which Miss Jessica Holmby was murdered. And they're about to compare the two to uh, demonstrate that both bullets were fired from the same gun, which is known to have been in your possession. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to do exactly what you expect me to do. Donald Sims, I arrest you for the willful murder of Jessica Homby. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. Now, I'll take the liberty of asking you one question. Do you wish to make a statement? What will happen to me? I don't know. They hang me? Will they hang me? You're not required to make a statement of any sort, Mr. Sims. Well, if you have nothing to say... Sergeant Monk, I killed her. You take this down, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I was talking to her at the King's house in Belgravia. She'd heard about the check. What check do you refer to, please, Mr. Sims? The one I I signed with the name of the King's equerry. It was for 400 pounds. The equerry had shown it to her. When it came back from the bank, marked R.D., and she recognized my handwriting at once. She said he'd already lodged a complaint against me, but that she could find forgiveness in her heart because she loved me. She offered me 400 pounds of own savings to make restitution and said we would forget about it and be married anyway. She, <laughs> she loved me, gentlemen. <laughs> Please, Miss Emmons. We talked for a while and then... As I took the money from her, the card fell out of my pocket as I took out my bullet. Oh, sorry. I, I started to pick it up. She'd evidently seen my name on it and asked, What's that? Reaching for it at the same time, I snatched it away from her, tearing off the corner you found. That uh, card you mentioned was the announcement of the wedding between you and Miss Ammon? Yes. Well, that's all there is to it. A frightful scene occurred between us. She became angry and I became violently angry. I, I found myself standing at the door with a pistol in my hand. I don't know how it got there, but she was dead and the pistol was in my hand. Hmm. Now, it's your opinion then that uh, you killed her. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Is that the whole of your statement, Mr. Sims? <laughs> They'll hang me. They'll hang me. I'll die. Well, if you'll read over your statement, Mr. Sims. <laughs> they'll hang me. You see? They'll hang me. Will you read and sign the statement, sir? <laughs> there is still plenty of time, Mr. Sims. <laughs> Time ran out on Donald Sims. He was brought to trial at Old Bailey three weeks later. His statement to the Scotland Yard men, the statements he made in court, caused the jury to bring in a verdict of willful murder. He was hanged on a Friday morning at 8 o'clock, still weeping. You have heard the ninth in the series Whitehall 1212, adapted from the official files of Scotland Yard. Research is prepared by Percy Hoskins of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper and produced by Collie Small and Jack Goldstein. (laughs) 